Revelations has been released, and we're going to tell you which cards are going to top eight the next throne open. Hello, everyone, and welcome to EffieCast episode 70, the five cards from Revelations that will top eight the throne open. I am your host, Sunnyvale, and along with me, as always, to discuss new cards and strap in, folks, because it's going to be a long ride. But I'm going to be having a long conversation with my buddy, Stormblessed, about some of these cards. How are you doing, Stormblessed? I'm doing really good. Very excited for today. Very excited for the set drop. This has been, in my opinion, Daryl Fidgetal's worst spoiler season to date. I thought it was decidedly unimpressive. The selection of cards they distributed for spoiler season were less than stellar. And the way that it spoiled things was also a bit awkward, like not hype inducing. Like they could have made ruins, sketches, or blueprints into their own special article to showcase them and, you know, hype up their uniqueness and cool playing patterns and stuff. But instead they did not. It was very noticeable on the last day, the day before the set was released on Monday. Like Scarlatch and like BK and LSV, they, you know, it was like five spoilers posted in a row. I was like, wow, these five spoilers are all more exciting than the cards we've seen before. It was a slight exaggeration, but I did feel like there was a lot of not greatly set up set beforehand. So um, I don't know if anyone else had that feeling, but that was just my impression of set. I mean, I was also a little burned down on Eternal after just a lot of playing with tournaments so close to each other and just a lot of interacting with the game. I was also a little bit burned out, so it's you know, possible that was, I was feeling that from there, but, um, but no, I think the set spoilers were pretty, pretty not great. And, uh, but the set was released and I am very excited for it. Yeah. I don't pay much attention to spoiler season for whatever reason. I've always been much more excited to see all the cards as a group than any, like, you know, hints dropped along the way of what we're about to get. So I actually didn't notice at all. Anyway, we are going to be spending today talking about all the cards that we didn't talk about last week. By the way, if you missed last week's episode, we did talk about the cards that were out as of a week ago. But we're going to talk about the rest of the cards. We went through every single card in the set and decided on the ones that we want to talk about. There's a lot of them, and we both talk a lot. So, uh, yeah, just like every other set review that we ever do, right? Yep, and you, if, you, if you love hot takes, I'm sure you'll find plenty of hot takes here. And if you love SRFS, you should <laughs> show it, demonstrate it in some way, because I know that this is always the hardest one to edit. So thank you, SRFS, for always being our editor. All right, let's get going. Um, ooh, there's something on here that I didn't put onto the show doc. What is this theme deck, Stormblast? Well, I just wanted to make a mention, as always, that with the release of a new set, there's theme decks that were released today. So with every set, there are five theme decks. Each of them come with one legend and a couple rares. and so. Um, if you're interested in getting some decent value for your gold, theme decks are always a good place to look. Yeah, this is really strongly recommended. I'm glad you pointed it out because this is something that, you know, I will often spend gold on because it's just a very efficient use of resources. So definitely recommend checking it out if any of the cards look like things that you want to play. There's no special bonus for the theme deck bundle this time, though. In the past, there have been bonuses where you get a special alt art card. I do not believe there's one this time, so... Uh, just just the regular theme decks like there used to be. All right. And with that, we're off to talking about all the cards in this set. So the first thing to talk about are the sketches. These are a cycle of powers, one for each faction that are similar to runes. In fact, I'm very surprised that we have both sketches and runes in the set, seeing as they work mechanically very similarly. Um, so sketches are also depleted if you have played a sigil this game, doesn't matter what kind. And they have Amplify X, make a relic with pay X to do Y. Yeah, and so uh, the time sketch it has Amplify 4. It makes a relic that you pay 4 to make a 2-1. Fire has Amplify 3. You make a relic that pays 3 to exhaust the enemy unit. Primal has Amplify 6, make a relic to pay 6 to draw a card. Justice has Amplify 5, make a relic where you pay 5 to double a unit's power and toughness. And then Shadow has Amplify 3, make a Relic with Pay 3 to give all of your units plus 1, plus 0. So there, there's two interesting things to note here compared to the runes. And that is that these, obviously, are, in some respects, are more expensive because runes you pay 5 and you get a spell right off the back. 
uh, because these you, you have to at minimum pay six to get the first effect, depending on which faction you're part of. But they also are, you know, they're permanent, right? You you get a recurring effect, whereas runes are you know one shot effects. So, Cindy, what do you think of these five sketches? Yeah, it's really weird. It's worth noting that the sketches are rare and the runes are common, so they think that the sketches are better, right? <laughs> if they want us to spend yeah. our shift stones, then <laughs> that means that the sketches are better. And I do think that's true. We talked about how a lot of the effects on the runes aren't fantastic at the point in the game where you'd be spending five power for them. So, like, if you're at the point that you are actually amplifying your power... Instead of spending on anything else, it does make sense that you'd want something that has a recurring effect, which all of these do. So I, I'm guessing that these are going to be better than the runes most of the time. But like, boy, that effect does seem really small, and you have to you have to have a deck that has sigils with it. I I feel like this is basically just a slight upgrade on runes for decks with Dovid, and then not a ton else, at least not in Throne. Yeah, I'm not convinced that these are better than runes for the most part. I think what's really nice about these in a lot of ways is it really depends on the deck as to which card is going to be better in it, right? Like, is the time rune better than the time sketch? It really depends on the deck. You know, some decks might want to pay for to make a 2-1 more, and some decks will appreciate the teleport more. Uh, you know, primal, right? The primal rune is stun an enemy unit. That's a highly tempo move, whether or not you're some sort of combo deck trying to buy for time or some sort of, you know, soldier-based deck trying to, again, buy for time, but in this case, to kill them with your units. Uh, whereas the Primal Sketch is the most value you can get, just for the slowest amount of time. You know, you're paying 12 to draw a single card. The Primal one specifically does not look that great to me. The Justice one is, in many ways, the most comparable to the two, whereas you're paying 5 to get plus 4, plus 4 once, whereas you're paying 10 to get, you know, plus X, plus X once. And then Shadow... It's still also different as well because the rune of illusion goes goes you know super tall and punches through, whereas the shadow sketch goes super wide. Of these, I've only played a couple of games because uh, the set just got dropped. But the first one I've tried out is the fire sketch. It looked interesting to me because it seemed good with aggression and producing a relic that's good with aggression, while also you know just making a free relic seemed good with sentinels, and uh, it was cute. It was fun, but it's day one, so who knows? Yeah. Also, it strikes me as. Uh, these are probably cards that you'd more likely play in Expedition than Throne, and we're kind of just focusing on Throne mostly today. And it's also really funny that they have Amplify. Like, you could theoretically Amplify them multiple times, but, like, there's no <laughs> reason to. It's just really weird. Like, they're using Amplify as Kicker, the MTG mechanic, as, like, an optional cost instead of, you know, something that you can do multiple times, which I think Amplify tends to tends to be. That's one of the interesting things about the Fire and also shadow ones to some extent is that those are the ones that you're the most likely to amplify twice you know eight and ten is pretty prohibitive you might do it with time i guess just because your time can like ramp pretty hard sometimes but like justice you're probably not making ten and making two of those to just you know you have to just double one once in one turn then do it the next turn uh, whereas fire you might go for the amp six especially if you are a sentinel relic deck that you know would appreciate having an extra relic in play so Fire and Shadow are basically the only ones that would amplify it twice compared to the others. All right, let's talk about some of the other cards. First one is a Fire 1 cost 1-1 one, one, Grenadin Beast, Spiny Grenadin. Entomb, create, and draw a Power Burst. So the most important thing about her is that she is absolutely adorable, and you better not touch any Spiny Grenadins that are under my control, or else I will have to defeat you just to get revenge for hurting my Spiny Girl. <laughs> that is all. Go ahead, Sunny. All right, so it's a it's a one drop that replaces itself. Granted, it it replaces itself with a power burst and not like a quote unquote real card, but that's a card that can be plundered. It can be used for the market. So I don't know if this is going to go in like a tesseract deck or some sort of like uh, display of destruction deck or something like that. But I think it's pretty unique in what it does in being a one drop that helps with the sacrifice ramp strategy. I like her design. I think that she's a cool design. It's kind of an obvious design in retrospect. Like, oh yeah, of course you have a Grenadine that does this. It just makes a lot of sense, actually. I'm glad it exists, and I think that there could definitely be a space for it. It's not like it's overpowered by any means, but it seems like it could slot into, you know, Tessa, for instance, now that we've, like, lost assembly line in x or something like that. I don't know. It's cool. I mean, obviously, I have zero experience with the card, <laughs> but this is the type of thing that I could see being, like, just the best enabler and yeah. um, being extremely powerful. 
I don't know, like being able to play stuff ahead of time is is a powerful thing and, you know, not to be trifled with too much. But that's something they're exploring with some of the cards they've printed. I don't know. We'll see. Oh, for sure. As we'll get to, there's a bunch of ways to cheat out power costs in this set. So uh, our next card is the Anglo Houndmaster. It is a two fire, two one soldier with quick draw and valor. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, valor states that for every unit that is blocking this unit, uh, it gets plus one, plus one. So if you block the Anglo Houndmaster with a 2-3, your unit will die and the Anglo Houndmaster will not because it become a 3-2. If you try blocking it with three assembly line tokens, uh, none of them will trade because Houndmaster will get plus three, plus three. So the Anglo Houndmaster also has additional text. When you attack with exactly two units, you may pay power equal to the number of cards in your hand to play a 4-4 Hellhound that is attacking. Yeah, I think this card's really good. Like, the rate is pretty nice. It doesn't hit for three, but it's really, really hard to block. I mean, you have to block it with an X4 in order to not get eaten. Like, you can't even trade with a 3-3 with this. And then late in the game, it has the ability to create 4-4s. I mean, not in a situation where uh, the 4-4s are necessarily going to do a ton, but I don't know, like, you could attack with this in a Thunder of Wings token, and 4-4 uh, is, it's like a reasonably sized body. And then this is, as we've already talked about, pretty difficult to block, so... I just think that it's it does enough early, it does enough late that this is going to be a card that we're going to see in some deck somewhere. I'm more confident for this card showing up in Expedition. I think Expedition could certainly see a number play, especially if we end up seeing like a soldier's deck move into fire. We have a number of fire-based soldiers now, so it's possible we could see like Skycrag soldiers or Rakano soldiers. I think this card is cool. I'm not not quite as high on it as, as a lot of other people, just because I think there is some awkwardness of, you know, throwing out your hand too quickly you know if you throw your hand on the board then you probably will have more than two units so but you can only attack with two of them so i think there's a bit of awkwardness here but i think the card has a distinct power level that is quite there it could you know easily make it an x bet i'm less sure about throwing although it's possible there as well also we should uh do the crafty grand in test not not crafty <laughs> grand in. the uh cook master yeti cook master test oh yeah <laughs> and this definitely passes that yes this card is is a lot better than yeti cook master so if you're going to play a uh, mono fire deck in Throne, uh, you play this before you're getting Cook Master. Yeah. The next card's an interesting one. Not quite sure if it's going to get there, but Rocket Blaster is a two cost, two, two, single fire. It's a Sentinel, and it says pay one, exhaust Rocket Blaster, and sacrifice a relic to deal three damage to an enemy. If you have a ways of getting tons of cheap relics that you don't care about sacrificing, this card is amazing. Three damage kills a lot of stuff, and you can do it repeatedly, although only once per turn. On the other hand, if you can't generate the relics, uh, this card might just not do enough. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it looks like we're set up in some capacity to have potential for this, right? We have blueprints that are obviously one-cost relics that, you know, are free, right? So then that allows you to pay two to deal three damage to an enemy for free, basically. Uh, we have cards like the Fire Sketch. Yes, you'd have to pay four to get this pay, deal three damage, but you're effectively getting it for free. So, you know... Paying four for a torch is a lot, but, you know, a free torch for four, now that's a little bit something else. Uh, we also have cards like Blitzstone, where if you play, you know, Rocket Blaster, then in the future play a Blitzstone, you can then deal five to something, right? So it's an, potentially another way to use Blitzstone uh, more effectively, depending on how you, you know, sequence the cards in your hand, along with some other cards. So I think it's just got an interesting effect, and I, I hope it sees play, although, you know, as Sunday said, right, you need to have enough relics. Relics tend to not be something you want too many of them. Yeah, or like you can't sacrifice them. Yeah, because you need them to stick around, exactly. But something that comes to mind is we do have things like Bottled Storm, Waystone Gate, and oh, yeah. even um the, what's the one that ramps you? Like something Reactor? Reactor Forge? Yeah, Reactor Forge. That like, you know, you, you don't want to <laughs> sacrifice it, but like this gives you a way to not die to it. You know, you know what's funny? For every other card that says like sacrifice a unit or relic, I've been like, oh yeah, Ballast and Waste Don't Gate. They make the cards extra busted. But for some <laughs> reason, this is the one card in the set that has Sacred Relic on it that I forgot Waste Don't Gate and Bottled Storm. But yeah, the second is right. Absolutely. This card's really good with those. I mean, pay four, deal three damage, draw three, pay four, deal three damage, make it eight eight. Hell yeah. All right. The next card is one of our stealth cards. I guess we should be keeping track of how many stealth cards we think uh, are uh, <laughs> constructed playable. So uh, this is a fire stealth card. It costs three. It's a 2-2 two, two single fire requirement. It's a mage soldier. This is Sanity Scorcher. Double damage and stealth. Intrigue 2, plus 2, plus 2. So you can play it as either a 3-cost unit or a 5-cost unit. 
and ultimate at the start of your turn reveal sanity scorcher to play mindfire now i think that the three drop slot is contested enough that this is not automatically slot in but it's not like if you have the right combination of uh situations where stealth is good and just like the flexibility to play it on three or five and pump effects in order to make the double damage really pop on this maybe this is going to be a good way to force in a lot of damage all at once mind fire is a powerful effect especially when you can play it for free you know it allows you to get a, a big hit in all at once and that's obviously as a fire deck sometimes you just want one big turn right that's all you want just one big turn with your units in throne not too keen on it you know the big problem is obviously it's a three cost x2 and especially if your only self units are perhaps an x2 and an x3 then you can be like okay i'll just always throw two damage at it and i'll be fine because uh, obviously you know the downside of this card is if it gets like charred or something like that even potentially if it just gets like one damage and revealed on your opponent's turn losing the mind fire is kind of painful right you have to reveal it on your turn to get the mind fire if the opponent just pings it off with a ruinous burst and you know kills your hound master you just have a 4-2 left over, and that's obviously not where you want to be in life. Oh yeah, I didn't think about the fact that it could get pinged and lose the mind fire. That's that's a really interesting angle. Um, mm -hmm. I do think it's on like the lower edge of playability, so we'll see if that ever becomes relevant. But if it does, that's like a cool way to interact with it. Speaking of the lower edge of playability, <laughs> Roar of Defiance. Four fire fire for a spell. Gain power this turn equal to the highest attack among your units. I have no idea what to do with this card. I'm not a super convoluted player, but this card can generate you a whole lot of power. Although, if it didn't do that, you're probably already like winning the game, probably. So, you know. Yeah, well, you need something that has six attack in order for this to be better than just like Kindle, right? I guess five attack to be better than Kindle, six to be better than Kindle with the spark. Is this better with Kindle than five attack? I mean, it generates plus one power. Kindle yeah, generates that's... plus one power, so. Yeah. It's the same as Kindle, but it costs more, so I'd rather still have Kindle then. Okay, sure. I don't know. There are ways of getting one unit that's really big, right? The best thing I can think of with this unit is Shift. Like, Zolta Paladin, Shift it, and then suddenly this gives you seven power next turn. Secret Weapon. Yeah, Secret Weapon gives you eight power. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there are, there are some things you can do with this, specifically with Shift, I believe, is the, probably the best way to go about doing it. But I will leave that to the combo experts. I don't think this is going to see play. I've tried Kindle in a lot of decks, and if Kindle <laughs> isn't making it, I don't think this is. All right, the next card is another stealth card. So we're up to two on our stealth tally. Callus Triggerman, five cost, single fire, four, three, quick draw stealth, ultimate at the start of your turn, reveal Callus Triggerman to play gun down or armed and dangerous. Notably, not a gunslinger, although it feels like it really should be. Um... I guess it's kind of like Makar Stranger in a way, in that like if it attacks, it kills something. I mean, it doesn't have to attack, but it does have to go to your turn, so it basically has to attack. And Armed and Dangerous is like, you know, if it don't have anything to kill, might as well pump your units by a lot, adding six attack to the board. Looking at it as a Makar Stranger, it's probably, probably a really good way to look at it. Like, you know, it's a five cost four three. This is also a five cost four three. Uh, Makar Stranger, if it attacks, you get to kill a thing. If this you know, attacks, quote unquote, uh, your turn starts, uh, you get to gun down, which is not quite the same as killing a thing because it can't kill an X6 or anything with quick draw, but it's still, you know, pretty decent. It's obviously just really powerful to have. Uh, and then obviously the difference in the upside is that the car stranger gets upside when you play it, whereas this has the stealth upside if that's relevant, and then also has the upside of, you know, your opponent can't really play around it by not playing units because this thing can just play armed and dangerous and just make your whole board very armed and very dangerous. <laughs> Alright, the next fire card, Pivotal Moment, 7 cost, double fire, spell. When one of your units hits the enemy player this turn, draw a card. It is free this turn, discard it at the end of your turn. So the only reason I have this here, I don't think you want to play it in any fair capacity, is I envisioned a scenario where if you have the, like, Getty Ice Chucker or whatever it is that deals 1 damage every time you play a spell, and you have glimpsed the possibilities and all of the power remaining in your deck are standards and every card in your deck is a spell you just get to play all the cards in your deck and they're sunny. all free and they all ping the opponent just for the record sunny i absolutely rolled my eyes once you started discussing this combo this sounds like worse than this roar of defiant secret weapon stuff we mentioned earlier so i was sort of into this card before you had just the word glimpse combo in the notes but now that you've outlined the actual combo, I am no longer interested at all. <laughs> hey, a lot of things have to go right in the glimpse combo. I'm going to just move on if that's all right with you. 
Yeah, that's fine. I, well, hey, look, I figured out a way to play an entire deck, right? With two cards, basically. Three cards. Anyways. Okay, three cards. Doomsday Assembly is seven. Fire, fire, fire. Your units deal double damage. When one of your units deals damage, you get plus one power this turn. And it also does Amplify one on top of being seven cost, which is the most hilarious thing ever. Uh, play a 1-1 one, one Ticking Grenadin. Uh, Ticking Grenadin, of course, is the 1-1 one, one that has Entomb, deal three damage. But since they are now double damage, it will Entomb, deal six damage. Uh, this card is just adorable. And I just wanted to look, look at the art. It's adorable. Not quite as cute as, uh, what is it, at, at, as Spiny Grenadin. Uh, Spiny Grenadin is obviously the cutest card in the set, but this card's also pretty cute. Yeah, I don't expect this to make waves in Constructed. Or Limited, for that matter. It's, I don't think this is very good. It's just really expensive. As we move into time, I would just like to briefly mention the sort of stealth archetype as a whole. There will be some sort of stealth deck, especially in Expedition, but probably not in Throne. But overall, a lot of the cards that sort of on the border of playability maybe could see if there's like some sort of stealth synergy deck. Me and Sunny aren't really going to be discussing, for example, a card called Cloak Guide is a one and a time for a 1-1 one, one flying. Units with stealth cost one less. Neither of us put it into our show docket notes. But if there is a stealth deck, obviously cards like this will see play in it. If it's time-based, it's probably going to be Elysian, let's be honest. But a lot of these sort of stealth synergy cards are sort of not being mentioned here because me and Sunny just don't think they're quite good enough. Well, the reason why I didn't play it is I think it's inferior to Logistics Expert or Initiative of the Sands. Like, having one power to play anything versus just essentially stealth units is uh, superior, generally speaking. Yeah, that's not a bad point either. Anyway, so the first time card that I've put down is Bound by Oath. Two in a time for a spell. Oh, I thought it was a fast spell. Oh, this is way worse now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a fast spell, but it's apparently a spell. Uh, it silences an enemy unit or silences a unit in the enemy player's hand. I like this as a fast spell because obviously it was fast at that point. Uh, allowed you to do interaction on the opponent's turn. But, you know, it does do something different, right? It has sort of this multiple interaction where you can interact on board. Or if they're going for a combo, you can interact with their hand, right? Because a lot of times the combo either will keep the units in their hand. Or if they go to the market, you be like, aha, they went to the market. I'm going to get rid of that Savetia or Overloader, depending on if Overloader is actually playing in the market these days or not. But it's a slow spell, so I'm far less interested now than I was when it was fast. Yeah, I was not interested in it. Next, Thunderfist Striker is a two-cost 2-2 two -two for a single time. It's Soldier. As Valor, when Thunderfist Striker hits the enemy player, she gets plus two, plus two until the end of your next turn. Um, I think this is good. I think this is going to attack and be tough to block, or at the very least trade. And then it's just going to keep on hitting because it's going to be a 4-4 four -four after that. This card's cool because it's not like easy, but you know, it's like it's easier on the first turn, but every other turn after that, you know, once it's a four for once, you obviously the opponent needs to play a five five or better to trade with it. And obviously, if you're trading your five five for their two drop, you're not really gonna be in a happy camper. So um very cool card. Of course, sort of the trade-off with this card is that you have to get the first hit in, which it's not impossible. It's not even like out of the question because it's a two-two with valor, right? So it's somewhat difficult anyways, but it's not a free lunch, so to speak. So I like that it's trade-off. I like it's a cool little aggressive card design. Next card is Frontline Healer. A three-cost, uh, double-time, 3-2 Cleric. It has Deadly and Stealth. Ultimate, when you take damage or play another unit with Stealth, reveal Frontline Healer to gain five life. What do you like about this card? Uh, there's lots of things I like about this card. Now, uh, I, always, I like this card a little bit better before uh, the expedition changes happened because we lost uh, a specific card that I'll get to in a second. We also lost Vows. Uh, because you could have played this and then played a vow and immediately gained five life. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, uh, Lumen Defender, right? The one five that gains five life, but it's cheaper. It's got stealth, right? So especially if there's a stealth deck, then, uh, you know, obviously this can see play there. Um, the other key interesting note about it is that it has an ultimate. And this is this thing I'm wondering about stealth in general, is they all have ultimates. And you know what unit type cares about ultimates a lot? Mandrakes. You, these are all ultimates you don't have to pay for, right? These are ultimates that you get kind of for free. So if you have a Mandrake, you have Frontline Healer, you can get a free ultimate off and get whatever benefits you want of ultimates. And the reason I like this card a little bit less than I used to is because they took Marius Mandrake out of Expedition. This card with Marius Mandrake would have been awesome because you get a free ultimate, so you get to draw a card for free, gain another two life, gain another five life on top of that, all for just playing a vow or whatever. Yeah, so depending on how this card works, I'm not sure whether I like it or dislike it because if you have to put it in combat where it's going to die and you take damage, I don't know if you gain the life. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know that either. But like the fact that it can also just not gain you the life if they kill it, 
and it doesn't get to trigger its ultimate, then I think this is inferior to other like anti aggro cards, which is where this is. It also doesn't like block aggro decks well as a three two. So I just think that this card is not well enough suited for its job that I'm going to like it that much. I think if there is a stealth deck, though, this will absolutely see play in the stealth deck. Okay, so moving on to a card that I just put down because it is my early frontliner for the worst card in the set that you will see again and again and again and again, over and over and over again, and wonder why people are playing it. Uh, This is Meditative Trance, three and a time for a relic. When you draw a card, you gain one life. This is Amaran Camel, the set one card, the 03 for Elysian in the same cost, uh, except now it's a relic, so now it's hard to interact with. Uh, You remember Decro's Ruin? This is like Decro's Ruin, but it's only for you. So I expect we'll be seeing a number of this card. Uh, it's not good, though. Don't play it. Yeah, I was surprised that you put it on. I mean, once upon a time, people used to play that card that gains you a health and an armor every turn. And I think this is better than that, but that's not saying a whole lot. Moving on, we have Nurturing Sentinel. Three in a time for a 1-4 stealth. It has an ultimate. At the start of your turn, reveal Nurturing Sentinel to draw a random sigil from your deck. So the reason that I put this down is, well, one, it's just, I, I you know, not, not really want to mention this too much, but like, this is a cool draft card, I think. But aside from that, if there's a stealth deck, I think this will be in some respects a linchpin of the stealth deck. It allows the stealth deck to block early. It allows the stealth deck to have different amounts of stat lines. So that way you can trick your opponent up and actually take advantage of the stealth mechanic. For example, if you have this card and frontline healer, your opponent, you know, do they throw a char at it? You know, if they don't, if, they, if it's just this, they get to take away its ultimate, but you're still left behind with a one four. And then also, importantly, it allows you to sort of ramp up. It allows you to guarantee your power drops in order to play your five-cost stealth cards. So the stealth deck, I think this will be, in some respects, a linchpin, a you know, key piece for the synergy. Uh, nice and super powerful, but I think it will be you know, crucial in this specific archetype. I think this is worse than Amber Acolyte in like every single way. <laughs> also, like you can't block with it the turn that you play it, because then you'll reveal it early, and then you don't get the ultimate. I mean, if your opponent attacks with the next one at all, I will just block with this and, you know, eat their guy and keep my one for round to block their aggro stuff in the future and just not draw my, my sigil, right? I'm perfectly fine doing so. that. The worst part is obviously X2s, right? If they play a 3-2 and attack with it, then you might just take three that one time and get your sigil and then block in the future. Yeah, it's really tricky to evaluate cards with stealth because we don't know how much that's going to play into effect. And even then, like after playing with these cards for a while, it will still be difficult to evaluate them. Again, I think this card will only see play in specifically the stealth deck itself. All right, the next card's a really interesting one. Sticky Flytrot. It's a three-cost stealth unit. It's a 3-3 Mandrake. Stealth ultimate when an enemy unit with flying attacks reveals Sticky Flytrot to make any me units unable to fly this turn. I don't know how good flyer decks are going to be, but boy, this seems like the biggest way to shut them down. I mean, I'm surprised and he's like, I don't like this other card, but I do like Sticky Flytrap. And I'm like, I don't know, I think this other, I think Nurturing Sentinel is just better than Sticky Flytrap. I think that they're both only basically playable in this ultimate, uh, either either ultimate deck, potentially, or specifically, you know, a stealth deck, right? Especially, like, the stealth deck makes it, like, day two of the expedition open. You know, having, like, a one of this, be like, I do have my flyer? I don't know. It could be the Sticky Flytrap I see in their deck list. So, um, you know, if you can, you know, play enough stealth cards, this card is cute but I am ultimately not very interested in it. That's fair. I guess I kind of had a limited mindset when I was talking about this card, but that's not what we're here to do. Absolutely limited, though. Okay, so our next card is a legend, and she, she's really good for a time card. Uh, <laughs> for a time time for a 4-4 four, four soldier. Uh, summon, when one of your units hits the enemy player this turn, play a random sigil from your deck. Pay 10 to give units plus 3, plus 3 this turn. So... You might not be getting that 10 quite as much, but it's kind of like a Grodov Stranger for four that can get more uh, sigils off the top of your deck right away. And obviously ramping on four is a lot different than ramping on six. So I think she's cool. So this summon ability doesn't stack, right? If you hit with two units, you only get one sigil. No, no, it's not one or more. It's just one of your units to any player. So I imagine it would be if you hit with two, you get two sigils, right? Okay, this, this is definitely something that needs testing. If you can get multiple sigils off of this, this might be really cool to play in like a Flyers deck or something. Um, But if you can't, then I think this card's pretty bad. I feel like it would say whenever if it was. uh... So the reason I think that it counts for all of your units and not just one of them is that the activated ability is pay 10. If it just ramped once, I imagine it'd be like 
pay eight or something or pay seven, right? The fact that it's pay 10 implies that you have some way to reach 10 power normally. And the only way you'd be able to reach 10 power normally with this card is if you could hit and, you know, ramp two or three times with it. Yeah. All right. Sure. But I could be wrong. I mean, I, I haven't tested it, so. Yeah, we'll have to figure it out. Let's talk about let's talk about both angles. If it is, you can ramp multiple times with it versus if you can ramp once with it. So if you can ramp once with it, it's probably not that good, right? Yeah, I think it's completely unplayable if you only ramp once. But if you can ramp two or three times with it, what do you think about them? Oh, yeah. Then I think that this is a really interesting effect. I don't know how good it is, but like, you know, end of term humbug storm into this and attack. That right there is two powers. That is exactly why I said this is a good card for a time card, because uh, time's got shafted recently. Anyway, so let's move on to better factions. Okay, well, not, not, we're not moving on to the great factions yet, but uh, we are moving on to justice. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, factions that don't have crafty occults to Grenahan are in pretty rough shape right now. That's all I'm saying. Anyways, we got justice here. We have the first card is a card called Awakening, and it does make the you know units with Awakened. Uh, this is a spell that says discard a card to play 2 one, one Awakened with Valor. Uh, obviously, producing units with Valor is kind of better than producing, you know, just regular tokens that don't have Valor, so it allows them to attack better, although they are just 1-1s. Uh, but notably, especially in Expedition, uh, this card lets you set up your discard synergy. A lot of these cards are uh, what I consider to be voided, but they say that they have an effect upon entering the void. We talked about a number of them last show, and this card lets you activate your voided cards for very cheaply, especially when these, these voided cards individual have a paying cost associated with them. So if you have to pay four to discard a card, you know, it's a lot harder to use these extra pay modes, whereas a card that costs one does not. So I don't know how good it'll be in like Throne, for instance, but in Expet, I think this will be a very good card in some sort of aggro-based discard-ish voided deck. I'm not too thrilled about this one. I think you need to discard the cards like for a higher purpose. Getting two one ones is not spectacular, especially since like I think the Valor on this doesn't mean a whole lot because your opponent can probably just ignore the tokens and take two a turn. I think it's a little bit better than that, but, um, you know, it could not be. It is, it is just a humble, potentially synergy piece of the deck. Obviously, it's not going to be your high power card, but uh, it, I think it could be a reasonable neighbor, but we'll see. Uh, speaking of discarded enablers and some sort of aggressive base voided aggro deck, uh, we have custom munitions, two and a justice for a relic. Once per turn, you may pay one and discard a card to give a unit plus one, plus one, flying, endurance, and war cry this turn. So it lets you get a big ur hit in, setting up for future big hits, as well as uh, letting you still block even. The initial cost potentially of three and discard a card is kind of expensive, but it does allow you to do all this voided stuff. So um, I kind of like it. I'm not, I'm, I don't know about it, actually. I honestly don't know if this card's good or not. I know in limited it's going to be absurd, but in constructed, I don't know. I guess it really hinges on how difficult it is to discard cards that you want to discard in uh, in Expedition, and then, like, you know, how desperate you are for that effect, right? Like, discarding cards has to be extremely powerful for this to be good, I think. Um, and I don't feel like they are. I, like, I think it's it's powerful, but I think it's powerful when you pair it with, like, Back Alley Delinquent, not something like this. The key is that there's a number of really good ways. Uh, a spoiler, you know, spoiler for the spoilers. Uh, we have a card called Collapse coming up when we talk about the Argent Port cards in the future. And that's always yeah. a really, really good upside, right? You're getting so much out of this discard effect, right? So if you can, you know, get a really powerful effect and then turn the discard from a downside to an upside, that's where you want to be in life. The sole purpose behind this card is the discard. You're not sort of getting a cheaper effect for a discount and then discarding. For the most part, you're using this for the discard. Yeah. Our next card is a super unique card, the first of its kind in many ways, and it is one of my favorite card types. Uh, so obviously it's one of my favorite cards in the set. This is Endless Steps. Apparently this card is what the Endless Step Rebuilder is rebuilding. I don't know if you guys remember that 6-5 from before, but yeah, they're rebuilding these steps. Endless Steps is a 3 and a Justice for a 3 health site, and it has your most recently played unit has plus X plus X equal to Endless Steps health. So if Endless Steps is a three health site, like when the turn you play it, your last unit you have in play, so the unit you've played on turn two, will get plus three, plus three. And then what you can do is on, say, turn four, you attack with your unit, then you play a new unit, and then that new unit will then get the new plus three, plus three, so then you can block and protect your Endless Steps better with your new buff, and then next turn you, you, keep, you can keep changing the buff around as needed to whichever unit is necessary. Now. Endless Steps has an agenda that is also super unique. 
It has four pieces to the agenda, so you have to go four times before you finally get the unit off of it. Its agenda is endure, 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 and endure. Endure is a spell that makes one unit invulnerable damage this turn. So obviously, in some respects, the dream with endless steps, or one of the dreams, is you turn to Hojin, turn three, play power, play endless steps, endure onto Hojin, and attack with a 9-8 Hojin for the turn. Also, you know, it triggers Kira, right? Because it's a spell that targets something, so maybe this is a Kira site, although we already have Lord Styre's Tower, but we can also make 8-site Kira, which is probably not a thing, but, um, but I'm going to try it anyways. Yeah, this is a really funny one. Um, I, I really love that there are four Endures, and it's just all the same spell, and you just have to keep on doing it over and over again. It takes longer to get the unit, and the unit is Terra, which is a three drop. So, like, I think most of the time you're better off just playing Terra. <laughs> like, right off the bat, just play a Terra <laughs> and get that War Cry in immediately, um, then playing this card. But, yeah, like, it's interesting. The The situation you ex- said with Hojan is, is one that, you know, makes use of Endure being something that targets something. Uh, the situation I was thinking of is if you're playing, like, some sort of Arcano aggro deck and you're just like super low to the ground and aggressive and your opponent just doesn't get a chance to attack back and you have to worry about your units living through the attack on your side but i i just don't know i I think that this is a really cool card but i don't think it's very good i don't know how good the card is and i don't know how good having four endures will be but one thing that i think is interesting about the card is that i kind of am thinking that the agenda being four is in some respects better because you'd rather not play the Terra. Because if you play Terra, the Terra gets the plus three, plus three off the site. And then you don't get to attack with this extra plus three, plus three boost, which is, I think, one of the key parts of the site is that, you know, it gives you large attackers, right? That's sort of a big deal with the site. Yeah. Having the fourth Endure means that you have one extra turn to try you utilize this extra plus three, plus three. But I don't know. It's weird because it, it, you know, it is unique. It has only one spell and it has four agendas. And, um, you know, its passive is super different. All right, the next card on our list is Recruitment Effort. I think this is going to be a big piece of the discard decks. This is a three-cost Justice Relic. The first time a player discards a card each turn, play a 2-2 Awakened Soldier. If you already have one, give it plus two, plus two instead. Notably, this is fantastic in the mirror. If both people are discarding cards, then you get soldiers on your turn and on their turn. And that is great. Um, I mean, this is just going to make the bodies that you need for that discard deck, right? Uh, it does not always make soldiers. It either makes a soldier or oh, makes a soldier yeah. become a 4-4, four, four, a 6-6, six, six, an 8-8, eight, eight, a 10-10, ten, ten, etc. Okay, but you might be sacrificing some of them to various sure. cards we might see. So maybe it does make more than one. But but that that is definitely an important part. It's It would be better if it made uh, multiple bodies and only makes one. I'm kind of not very high on this card. I think this card is kind of weak, perhaps. I suppose cards like this are what helps make cards like Customs, Munitions, or Awakening better, because then you might just want the, you know, super, super ultra-critical mass of discard effects, because the the benefit to the Voided cards is that, in some respects, you don't have to discard them. A lot of the time, you want to discard them, because then you can play them for cheaper, or for free, even. Uh, But playing them straight up isn't always the worst thing ever, especially because, for the units, specifically not the spells, obviously, but for the units, you know, their Voided effect also works when they're, you know, pseudo in tomb right when they go from the battlefield to the void you'd rather discard them but it's not like the end of the world if you have to play out your you know elding or your iron priestess if you're playing that in exped yeah our next card is a cursed relic for three and a justice called manacles summon stun two enemy units they stay stunned but you have manacles when either of them readies or dies sacrifice manacles so it's kind of like a double permafrost, but in with different conditions on it for three costs. Yeah, this one's really interesting. I love the flavor on it. Like <laughs> you're chaining two people up, and uh, if one of them gets unchained, then they that they free the other one. Man, this is this is interesting. Like it has a really high ceiling, but also a really low floor. Yeah, one thing that I wonder about this card is, um, I wonder how it interacts with multiple manacles. Can you stun the same enemy unit multiple times? Like you can put a permafrost on a permafrosted unit, right? So if, you, if your opponent has three units and you manacles two of them, and you play a second manacles on another two of them, what happens then? <laughs> like, if they sacrifice... I mean, if they sacrifice the one in the middle, I guess they just get both units freed. If they sacrifice the one on the edge, they get one unit freed? Do they get none of the units freed? I don't know. Um, the other thing I think is interesting about this card is if you care about having relics in the void, 
this card is interesting because then you can turn its liability into somewhat of an advantage, right? You know, you're not, it's not as great as, you know, keeping them stunned forever, but it's not, you know, the end of the world. But the huge downside of this card is the readying, right? If your opponent readies one unit, they get both units free. That's a huge blowout. But if your opponent just, you know, plays yeah. Devour on one, it's not the end of the world, right? Because they're still losing one of their units, right? If one of the units dies, they free the other one, yes. But their other unit's still dead, and you still got the tempo from it being temporarily stunned at the very least. So this card mitigates its downside somewhat by, you know, if one of them dies, it's still not terrible. Yeah, I, I think I'm actually starting to turn around on this card. Like, its upside is just fantastic. Like, yeah. what other spell for three can remove two units if all they do is attack and block, and your opponent can't deal with relics, right? Like, it's it's yeah. pretty hard to ready a unit in Constructed. Like, not yeah. that it's hard as in you can't do it, but it's hard in that most decks don't try to do that. Yeah, I mean, if this card becomes popular, maybe they will. They'll switch up their, you know, market interaction, right? And that's also something interesting, right? You know, having to adjust your market and your deck to meet the metagame is cool, and meeting the removal that exists. I think the card's actually pretty good, honestly. Okay, so the next card is Sky Sweeper. This card is specifically just Expedition only. Just want to get that off the back before someone's like, why is Stormbloods put this card down? This is three and a justice for a 2-2 Stealth Sentinel. Ultimate at the start of your turn, discard a card and reveal Sky Sweeper to give it plus two, plus two in flying. A three cost 4-4 four, four Flyer in Exped is pretty good rate, especially if, you know, if maybe there's another Stealth card that's interesting in a sort of discard voided deck. Uh, and of course, this card lets you fuel your voided stuff, right? You know, you, you get your sort of under-costed threat, and you get the additional potentially upside of discarding a card. Yeah, also, three cost, four for flying is like a big deal. I'm surprised that this isn't uncommon. Oh, you have to discard a card. And yeah. in limited, that's probably going to be a downside rather than upside. No, but I think this card is going to be really good and constructed. It's just a matter of making sure that survives until your next turn so you can get that ultimate... It's just a solid card. I don't think I'll see play in Throne, um, but I do think I'll see play in Expedition. The next card might not see play in either, except maybe in the market, potentially. This is Experimental Force Field. Very, very experimental design. You know, feeling very experimental about how you would use it. This for Justice Justice for a Relic Weapon. Enemy units without flying can't attack you. You have minus one maximum power for each enemy without flying. So this card's cool because if your opponent, if they have no burn, no ways to kill Relics and no Flyers, they obviously just can't win the game. But obviously, if they play, say, you know, eight eight eights for eight or whatever, they just have eight eight eights in play, and you have minus eight maximum power, they just sit there and wait, and then they draw a snowball, they snowball your force field, your force field dies, and they attack you with the eight eights, then you die. And it's got a massive downside, so maybe a transpose market for specific, specific matchups, but that's really about it as far as I can see. I love the name Experimental Force Field because it's not going to work. <laughs> no. I don't know, just the downside on losing power is so big. I cannot overstate how big that is. And and decks are going to have some way of getting rid of this, whether it just be like a torch or even just like an ability like Argentport Instigator plus a removal spell or something. I don't know. And obviously versus any combo deck, this card's not going to do anything. Like Mac combo yeah. won't care. Eccentric Officer won't care. Reanimator probably won't care because they probably have flyers. Yeah, this card, it's interesting, but it's probably, you know, you, don't, you won't need to craft more than one of it. I can't imagine playing four of it main deck. <laughs> uh, the, the, other, the only other place that I could see it potentially, and I don't think this is necessarily even good, uh, would be like clear the way, because clear the way can clear the way for zero, right? So if you have zero maximum power, you can still do something. But then you still have the downside <laughs> of, you then have to defend against these eight eight eights that I've hypothetically set on the board with your two three sixes, so. Yeah. I was going to make some sort of joke about like combining this and Silver Legion and then you win the game or something like that. <laughs> but then I realized that you can still attack with your units without flying. So that doesn't even work. Um, oh, yeah, they, they could attack sites and they also can attack killer. Yeah, you're right. Oh, and I was referring to a Magic the Gathering deck that used Moat and Sari. Oh, and now we have Moat. Anyway, um, it doesn't really work and it's bad anyway. Next card is Great Blade. And uh, despite the name, I'm not sure if this is great, but I think it might see some play. So it's a five cost weapon, plus three, plus three, double justice. While the wielder has more health than a player. Oh, I read that wrong. <laughs> it has double damage. Endurance and is invulnerable to damage. Uh, amplify three, play challenge by the... Okay, I read this totally wrong and <laughs> I don't think this card is good anymore. 
I was wondering why Sonny put that there, and I was like, I was like, I bet Sonny just didn't read the card properly. I'm gonna wait for the penny to drop, and boy, did it drop! I was thinking that if it had more health than attack, then like you could put nope. this on a uh, a, a commando, whatever it's called, unseen commando, and deal a ton of damage. But yeah, um, never mind. Let's move on. Wait, I I would like to say two things. about one, uh, Sonny brought this up briefly earlier. Having amplify, what is it, three on a five cost card is just very weird it's like it's like not spellcraft right yeah because you can do it twice but you really can't one of the only cute things i saw was like momentum builder which is the zero ten, where you slap this on momentum builder <laughs> and then you have a zero thirteen, and that's like your best odds of letting something have more health than a player but even then that's just so bad yeah it turns itself off too i totally messed that one up so our next card is a stealth card by Justice Justice for a 3-6. Awakened, Kai Awakened Master. Summon, each unit in your hand gets a random battle skill, uh, which is, what was that 2-2 two, two for 2 that used to do that for one unit? Tranquil Scholar? Tranquil Scholar, yeah. This Tranquil Scholar is every unit in your hand. And then it has an ultimate. When you play another unit, reveal Kai to play Kai's Blessing. Kai's Blessing is a spell. One of your units becomes awakened. Give its battle skills to each unit in your deck. Would you like to give your whole deck killer? What if you have like Exalted? What about Exalted and Lifesteal? These are dreams you can have with Kai. This card gives you lots of dreams and, um, you know, looks really fun. I don't know if it's going to be a tier one card specifically, but it looks really, really fun. And it looks like you can live the dream. And also, you know, its base rate of just being a 3-6 for 5 isn't the end of the world. Yeah, it kind of succumbs to like sending agents and annihilates but like it does have a giant health so it can block pretty well although you're not going to block with it if you block with your stealth unit on that turn you don't get the ultimate but i like it i do like it i think it's fun you know what this looks like to me wasteland broker oh come on oh come on <laughs> gotta admit it though right it's not wasteland broker i mean i mean cards in your deck are fake but all right come back to me once you've decided that's not wasteland broker or i i don't know if it is wasteland broker i don't know okay we both okay whatever next on to the primal cards uh this one's an interesting one obstructive flicker one cost double primal fast spell deal one damage to each attacking enemy or negate an enemy spell that isn't fast so uh very good in two different situations that are um well i guess i can't say they're like super rare but like it's definitely possible to see that this card can get a blowout in two different types of decks. Yeah, uh, Objective Flicker is such a cool design. But before I begin with my other point, um, I'd just like to recommend the Friends of Eternal Discord. It is the best place to be to discuss uh, Eternal strategy and content, post your decks, talk about the game, You know, have a good time. It's a great place to be. You guys should take a look. We'll put links in the doobly-doo. Um, and, you know, it's a great place to be. Now, the reason I bring that up specifically is that recently, over the past few days, before that was released, there was a lot, and I mean a lot of discussion about combo decks, how to beat combo decks, if combo decks are, like, beatable, like, if the trade-off is worth it to play a card that beats combo, if it's going to lose you versus an aggro deck. You know, like, like you can't play main decks with refusal, or even, like, even like a lot of times main deck counter spells, because if you're playing a negate main deck, you know, you're just going to lose to a bunch of Sunny's Monofire units. But this card lets you have a main deck negate and helps you beat some aggro. So this card is potentially main deckable, certainly marketable, very flexible, very powerful. I am a big fan of this card. I think this card is a great design because it's also not like too good, but it has like a lot of use cases. So I think this card's really cool. I don't know. I think this is too good. This beats a lot of decks that i want to play so. yeah yeah you want to you want to play all the exploits and you want to play the combo decks so you know of course they're gonna destroy anything yeah. you want to play yeah i mean they have to be attacking so like if you're playing something like kira you can really easily play around something like this so i guess maybe it's not too bad anyway um yeah this is super powerful getting more cards that negate spells that aren't fast is it's a thing definitely a thing yeah it compares well to swift, swift refusal of course is the one in a primal fast spell that negates an enemy spell that isn't fast. Uh, this card is strictly better if you have double primal. Uh, obviously, if you're playing a super low-to-the-ground aggro deck that's playing three factions, playing a bunch of Diplo seals where you can't guarantee the second primal, you'll still probably want Surfusal in your market over Obstructive Flicker. 
but in a deck, in a two-faction deck, in a deck that can reliably get the second primal, this card is just better than Swift Refusal. And that's not yeah. bad for the game either. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not super happy about it. I, this <laughs> is a lot like Dazzle. Um, I think that's sure. a pretty close comparison. So, an effect against units and also effect against spells. Some people think we need more cards of, like this in the game. I am fine without them, but yeah, whatever. I think this card's going to see some play and make an impact. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this next card for just a second. I'll say straight up, Sunny. You do not have to make a sealed comment with this card if you don't want to. This card is Runic Transformation. It is one and a primal for a fast spell. And if you are a fan of the card Randori, maybe because its name is really fun to say, or its effect is really really ridiculous, uh, you might love this card. This card has transformed two of your units into each other. So it's like just the almost, it's not exactly the case, but it's basically just a better Randori, of course, showing the supremacy of Primal over time once again, because this card allows you to have synergy with your transform effects, uh, like Glenn Fasciata, right? You can, you know, transform Glenn Fasciata and the 3-3 three, three into each other, and then you get a second 3-3, three, three, and you have a second Glenn Fasciata to, you know, do more transforms in the future, right? So that's obviously sort of the dream with this card is that one card from the campaign. Fun card! Should have some fun uses, but probably not good enough. Almost certainly not good enough, but definitely a cool design. It should be fun to play with. <laughs> I mean, this is the ultimate trash or broken card, right? <laughs> there's something broken to be doing with it. Like, this could be just, like, totally busted, but it's probably absolutely terrible and worthless. Speaking of trash or busted cards, we have this next relic weapon. Uh, a three-cost 04 relic weapon for three and a primal. Uh, so it can't attack, but it has summon. Play a 4-3 Mist Asri with Flying Aegis and Reckless. Entomb, sacrifice that Mist Asri. Now, 3 cost for a 4-3 Flying Aegis Reckless, that is under-costed for the flyer you get from that. Of course, there's a huge downside if you lose the Mist Helm, especially if your opponent you know, just attacks with a 4-attack guy after you have to attack with your Mist Asri. Uh, you just lose your Mist Asri for free. So, you know, big upside, big downside. Now, the key with this card in many ways, I think, will be... Um, I, mean, I don't know if Tyara can silence your own relics, uh, so you could silence your own relic. Uh, but also, you know, you have a number of things that allow you to transform relics. For example, if you went Mist Helm into, I think, the 5-3, the, the, uh, the old, old Olzai, Evolving Olzeal, it transforms a relic or a site into a 4-1 soldier. So uh, if you play cards that allow you to transform relics into other things, you can keep your 4-3 Flying Aegis and Reckless and also get a secondary unit on top of it. So I think that would be the way to go with Mist Helm. All right, yeah. This is so good against some decks and so bad against others. Um, the nice thing about it is, at the very least, like the 4-3 can block the turn that you play it. So if you're against some sort of aggro deck, you can block with it. But, man, I think there are a lot of decks out there that would love a 4-3 Flying Aegis for 3 and I mean, the fact that it has Reckless doesn't matter a ton because you're probably just attacking with it every turn. But the downside is absolutely tremendous. Remember, Reckless is all upside, kids. It, pre it prevents you from making mistakes with your units. <laughs> yeah, interesting card. Could be good in the right situation or the right metagame. Probably not. On the complete opposite side of the it's either trash or broken deck is a card that will be always fine, never amazing. The floor is just about as good as its ceiling. It's not that high up either. It is Hidden Crusader. It is three and a primal for a 2-3 soldier. When Hidden Crusader is revealed on your turn, draw a card. If he's revealed on the enemy turn, play a 2-2 soldier. So basically, uh, you, you, can't, you can't kill it without it being revealed. It's always going to be revealed some way or another. So it will always kind of be a 2-4 and it will always get some amount of value. The value is not particularly great, I guess. You'd probably rather draw the card than not. This card almost certainly, once again, will be, be a staple in the stealth deck which i imagine will be elysian because that seems to be the faction that has a bunch of stealth synergies as we will see when we get to the elysian cards yeah cards fine it's not amazing maybe it sees a play in a soldier deck because it makes an extra soldier but even then it's just there it's just there it really is just there <laughs> okay so the next card is really nice to have uh, especially for expedition <laughs> well okay it's not that great in throne but it will be great in expedition just because if you remember the last expedition cycle we didn't have board clears, right? There was no board clears. And everyone's like, there's no board clears, where? And I was one of those people who said that. Uh, I'm also blocking myself, by the way. This is Cover from the Storm. Cover from the Storm is four primal primal for a spell. Deal three damage to each non-hidden unit. Now, obviously, if you are playing stealth units, uh, this card you know, doesn't hit your own stealth units. 
but basically it's a four cost hailstorm and you know what an expedition four cost hailstorms might just be what the format needs yeah obviously you'd want to set this up with a stealth card into the uh cover from the storm but yeah i think you'll take it at this point like there are not many ways to sweep the board um, aside from cyber combustion. Yep. So like anything that is capable of sweeping the board, I think is really interesting. It also curves perfectly. Three drops stealth unit into four cost this. I think it's exactly why it costs four. It's a good design. It's a design that's very conditional. You know, not every set's going to have stealth. It also allows an excuse, quote unquote, to print a four cost hailstorm because of how it synergizes with the stealth stuff, right? If it was three cost, Obviously, it'd be just better if it cost three, but it would be aesthetically awkward and like mechanically somewhat awkward and inconsistent with other stealth units. It also, you know, puts the four exhibition format at a lower power level than Throne while being an interesting design, justifying itself, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, next card uh, is a card I'm very curious to hear Sunday's opinion on. I almost didn't put this card down, but then I kind of reread it a couple of times and was like, no, this, this card's actually, I think, pretty good, maybe. Uh, it's four primal primal for an elf soldier. Uh, once again, it's a soldier for soldier tags. Uh, when you attack with exactly two units, they get plus one, plus one, and overwhelm this turn. Draw a card, then discard a card. So you attack with two units, both of them get plus one, plus one, and then you get a free loot on top of it. Sonny, what do you think of Valise before I go any further? I don't think it's that great. I think that attacking with exactly two units is going to be awkward a lot of the time, unless you've got some sort of like evasion or way of making it happen naturally. And then drawing card and discarding card is not an effect I like that much on eternal cards. So I was thinking about it like, or I guess it'd be like a turn five thing or whatever. But like if you play it, then you activate Daru Lee, make Daru Lee a five four, attack with like Daru Lee and a four four or whatever. You know, then you get a six five and a five five overwhelm and a loot on top of it. And that seemed pretty good and aggressive because obviously one of the ways you can sort of keep the soldier deck down in a sense is through a rigorous chump blocking. And then, you know, winning over top of them eventually after you chump block enough times, right? Like a combo deck, for instance, you know, but this helps you push through damage. It loots even. I think if it didn't have the draw cards card card, I'd be very much less interested in it. But I think it might have just enough potential to see play, although I'm not I'm not convinced of it either. But, you know, I think the overwhelm is kind of what made me not uninterested in the card. Let's put it that way. I guess so. And here's the thing about a draw and discard. I think that if we didn't have plunder, it would be like good. But you already have ways of yeah. improving the card quality in your hand. And like markets make it so that, you know, that's way better than draw one, discard one, right? Well, notably in Expedition, we don't have markets anymore. I don't know if we mentioned this at the top of the show, but Expeditions, the only market effects are set 10 market effects. The grafters, the, the weird limited only commons that aren't really good, and like Zoom coercion. We don't have merchants. We don't have etchings. We don't have the spells. We don't have like Condemn, for instance. So markets are a lot worse. There are a lot more uses for cards in your hand now than there have been in the past. I guess, but like, I'm still super low on this card. I don't know, sure. like, the Overwhelm is the relevant part of it. I'll definitely give you that, but I still don't think it's enough. The art is sweet, though. Love bears. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, every, every time we get a battle bear, those are always great. Uh, the next card is the sort of the most Bergen card of the set. I'd be remiss and i feel like i'd be doing a disservice to the bergen the steam member of the community the con always control always the bergen uh this is crackling bobble seven primal primal for a relic at the start of your turn draw a card and deal its cost in damage to the enemy player no longer must you actually kill them because your card draw will do it for you yeah you'll never see me play this card <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah you will not catch sunny ever play this card if you see sunnyvale playing this card it's an imposter account, or you should like report Sunny as a missing person on the FE Discord. Be like, Sunny's missing. I see him playing Crackling Bobble. Yes, exactly. But the Bergen will definitely be playing this card. I can tell you that much. All right, let's get into shadow cards. So the first card is Shadow Path Intimidator. It's a two cost single shadow Minotaur? Question mark Rogue does not look like a Minotaur <laughs> at all. It's a 2-2. Two -two. Summon an enemy unit of your choice can't block this turn, or a player of your choice discards the top two cards of their deck. This is an interesting one because it's like kind of maybe a good aggro deck because it can remove a blocker for a turn, but also it's a 2-2 two -two instead of being something more threatening for two. And it also might be able to do some enabling of discard strategy. Yeah, I think this card's probably maybe more for Expedition, although I think that a 2-2 two -two that has different upside of potentially, you know, Making it so you can your units can get aggressive. I think it is 
maybe probably better than Spite Feeder, because I've never been really impressed by the 1-1 one, one flyer for one that mills two. Whereas this is a 2-2 two, two for two that mills two, or makes it so your units can get into the attack. And I think this a little bit better of a stat line, unless you, you know, actually kill your opponent a lot faster. Especially in Expedition, where we don't have things like, I don't think we have Spore Folk in Expedition. I can't imagine they put Spore Folk in Expedition. Uh, that, would be, that would be absurd. But yeah, so this card could be just like a solid role player in the Voided strategies, you know. Uh, because especially because the void strategies are probably going to be more aggressive, right? So you can you can take advantage of both sides of the card early in the game. You can build the top two cards of your deck to try to play those voided cards, play your faceless ones, play your eldlings from the top of your deck quickly to get a quick advantage. And then later in the game is when you know you kind of need to push on the board a bit more. You can stop your opponent from blocking and push in with a bunch of your smaller units that way. So I think the card could be a very solid role player. Yeah, I think that if you're into self milling. What's the one that mills the top two? Spite Feeder? Yep, Spite Feeder. Yeah, that I, I think that's a lot better at enabling the milling plan. I mean, obviously it's one cost cheaper, that, that's big, but the unit's just so bad. Like like a 2-2 two, two for two, even if it doesn't fly, even if it has no other text, is just so much better than a 1-1 one, one for one. Now, that, that's never been my my specific deck of choice, so I'm probably underrating Spite Feeder quite a bit, but just from my experience, I think I'd prefer this card over Spite Feeder. All right, the next card's an interesting one. Twisted Farmer, two cost, shadow, one, three. Ambush, amplify one. Play a one, one mandrake that dies at the end of your turn. So basically, you get to play X minus one expendable blockers, where X is the amount of power that you spend on this card. Interesting synergy with cards like Overloader that might care about amplify, but uh, other than that, a good way to get a lot of cards in your void if your opponent's attacking. Yeah, this this card is really cool. It's got a lot of uh, interesting use cases. You know, I, I I like the card a lot. You know, one thing Sunday did not mention is that uh, one, it's I think it's X minus two chump blockers, right? Because you have to pay two for the farmer, and the farmer yeah, sticks around like, and dies. Farmer might just be a chump blocker in itself. Sure, <laughs> sure. But notably, these also don't die at the end of the turn. They die at the end of your turn. So you amplify the end of your opponent's turn. Say on turn four, you make three units. You start your turn. You play shrine to carve it. And then you get a big shrine turn with a surprise amount of tokens, or just, or just in general, you get a surprise amount of attackers. So it has it has it has a lot of interesting surprise factor and a lot of interesting dimensions because it's not just you can get a bunch of blockers; it's also that you can get a number of attackers too, or sacrifice fodder, or you know just leaving up other fast interaction like display of menace. Because you know obviously with display of menace and this card, they both get better together because you can hold up one or the other depending on what's better for the situation. Yeah, really interesting card. When we last left our heroes, they were in the middle of a shadow card set review. They were deep in it. (laughs) When we last saw our heroes before they had to go eat dinner, we were talking about shadow. And since I don't have a good segue, this is our segue to talk about Shadow. So the next card on our list is 3 to Shadow for a 3-2 with Stealth. Ultimate, pay 1, discard a card, and reveal Stalking Assassin, deal 3 damage to the enemy player, and gain 3 health. Now obviously with this card, what you're going to want to do is either, you know, you play it on 4 to activate its ability, or you have to activate it before you attack with it. This card's not going to be blocking because that's not its rule. So you obviously have to activate its ability before you can get dealing damage, otherwise you won't get its ultimate off. The reason this card has potential is, you know, obviously maybe there's some sort of stealth stuff, although I don't think it's really a stealth deck thing, although it does have some synergy in the discard style of stealth, because we have a card called Sky Sweeper. Uh, but yeah, this has discard synergy, it's super aggressive, discard deck is probably going to be somewhat aggressive, so if you're going for a voided deck of using all these voided cards, Stalking Assassin in, ex- in Expedition specifically, not in Throne, definitely not in Throne, but Expedition... I could see this card seeing play in a hyper aggressive voided strategy. Yeah, I'm just pretty sad if like discarding cards for no value is where you <laughs> have to be in expedition to play the deck. Like it just feels so bad. And if you're playing what is it? Uh the the three cost justice relic that makes uh two twos or makes them bigger every turn if you discard, suddenly you're gonna be wanting to discard lots of cards. I mean, I guess, but like I think you wanna be discarding them from your deck, which doesn't affect your hand size as opposed to discarding from hand. Sure. Anyways, next card is a bit more interesting. Some have deemed it 5 cost slay. Some have deemed it not 5 cost slay. We'll let you guys decide for yourselves as well. If this is 5 shadow shadow for a mandrake, it is a 5-5 with lifesteal. Summon. You may kill an enemy unit. 
then ambitious Mandevilla gets minus X minus X equal to that unit's attack and health. So basically, if you kill a 3-3, three, three, it's a 2-2. Two, two. If you kill a 2-2, two, two, it's a 3-3. Three, three. So it's kind of like a 5-cost torch that leaves behind anywhere from a 0-0 zero, zero to a 2-2. Two, two. Or is 5-cost slay that leaves behind a 0-0 zero, zero to a 2-2. Two, two. Kind of. Yeah, I like the flexibility of this card. First of all, you don't have to kill anything if for whatever no. reason you don't want to. Second of all, you can kill anything. Like, it doesn't matter how big it is. It's not limited to just being 5-5, five, five, right? And uh, there's all sorts of ranges that can be in between. Now, something that really helps it is you've got that Mandrake spell that brings back two Mandrakes from the Void. This this might be a good target for it. I mean, you can use that 5-cost spell as, like, a double removal spell or, like, removal plus a threat, which I think is pretty cool. But, like, it's very recursive. You can keep bringing it back, and I'm like, well... You can bring it back <laughs> once. You can't really bring it back a second time. Uh, that, that could very well be enough, right? Bringing this back plus like Vine Grafter or whatever, or, you know, Venomous Nightshade rather. Um, you know, getting a Venomous Nightshade with a, you know, kicker to kill a thing. That's pretty good. Uh, you know, kill the kill a 2-1, kill a 3-2 with this. You get a good sized body and also it has lifesteal, right? So against the decks where it's slightly larger, it's going to be relevant because the decks where it's going to kill relevant small things are in the aggro matchup so yeah i like this card a lot actually i think this is uh, also you know maybe like a xenon deck xenon might like effect like this you know just kind of removal on a body uh this this sort of removal style is much more interesting than shadow akaria because you have to think about how you're going to remove things you have to think about how it's going to be used put it in a deck where maybe you bring it back so it's got much more interesting gameplay decisions and deck build decisions than shadow akaria ever did oh yeah definitely i like this card i think it's going to see expedition play all right, now we get on to the real part of the uh, set, the two <laughs> big hitters that I think are going to make a pretty big impact. The first one is Elding of the Final Hour. This is a five cost, six, three, double shadow, although who really cares what it costs? <laughs> Stealth, uh, double shadow, when Elding goes to your void or hits the enemy player, you may sacrifice another unit or relic to play a random pale rider. So you can imagine playing a turn two Grenahan, milling this uh, off of it and if you have double shadow you can sacrifice the granite hen and now you have a pale rider instead of a granite hen that sounds pretty good you can do that also with sporeful you can also just play this and then when it dies you can upgrade one of your units to a pale rider yeah notably you do need a unit in play in order to make this work preferably one that is you know low investment so that you're not sad about sacrificing it but I mean, those types of decks, those discard decks, they play a lot of chaff, like think even handed golem. I, OK, you can't play even handed golem, <laughs> this, but like <laughs> that's, that's just a card that people have played before. But like, you know, cards like Sporefolk and and Grenahan and the token off of Crafty Occultist. And speaking of which, it would be really interesting to note if that works the way that you want it to or not. I suspect it is, but I'm also not sure. Anyway, those types of decks tend to have cards that you don't mind sacrificing to upgrade to a pale rider i don't think this is as good as Felrock, but i definitely think that this is going to be a big part of those discard decks yeah i think sunny was on the ball with everything he said even if he i think he's underselling it even slightly in many ways you know remember how absurd dovid is this card's like a build your own dovid except your dovid doesn't have a downside with entombing and it also has an upside with an ability you know play grenahan draw a card mill this and you're like running gives a 4-4 life still, you're gonna have just got a plus three plus one for free. This card is the Nutter Butters. Uh, also, thankfully, it has stealth, which meant that Daryl could not make this have six cost or four cost, so it could not see played even hand golem decks. So <laughs> thank you for having stealth, uh, Elding of the final hour. This card is it's funny because there's a cycle of these stealth legendaries where every faction gets a five cost legend with stealth. It's funny that the shadow one is, you know. Not really a minion in many ways. It's mostly just a spell that just says when it goes to your void, you know, you do a thing. And this card's absurd. I've already seen, you know, day one, uh, seen board states where turn two happens and they have four units in play and two of them are Pale Riders. And it's just absurd. On top of that, one thing I haven't seen yet and one thing I will try is that this card also is sack a unit or relic. So we mentioned earlier the Bottled Storm and Waystone Gate shenanigans. Imagine doing that, but instead you're also getting a Pale Rider along with your three cards <laughs> or an 8-8. You know, that sounds also really good. Think more realistically, the uh, dual power. <laughs> yeah, I mean, blueprints are realistic. Blah, 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 blah. I want to dream big. Another dream big is uh, Haunting Scream. 
the hardest stream, you haunting stream back in your stealth unit, and the opponent's like, oh no, what could it be? They'll have no idea. <laughs> Unless they look at the void and see what's missing. Yeah, this, this card, just so incredibly powerful. As Sunny said, it's not as good as Felrock, but Felrock is one of the most busted cards in Eternal. So being a quote-unquote fair Felrock still leaves this as also one of the best cards in Eternal. Yeah. Uh, speaking of cards that are fair versions of Felrock, because <laughs> this card also feels kind of, in, some, in some ways like a fair version of Felrock, Elzing is the sort of unit side, and this card's the spell side. Uh, this is send a message. This is five shadow shadow for a spell. The enemy player must sacrifice a unit and discard a card from their hand. So that's like, oh, that's kind of expensive for five costs. But if you have shadow shadow influence and you and this card is voided, so if this card goes to the void, you may pay two to play it from the void instead. So if you discard it, instead of costing five, you get this effect for two. So you get whatever bonus you get for you know your discard outlet, right? Because Presumably, you're not just throwing cards away, you're getting some benefit from them. Whether that's, you know, making a 4-4 flyer, or, you know, destroying an enemy unit, or whatever. You also get this incredibly tempo-efficient effect. This card, this card's also just really good. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. I, I didn't think of it as being, like, basically a fell rock that costs two, but that's kind of what it is. Uh, like, you, you have to have two up, which leads to weird sequencing things, because a lot of times you play fell rock, you're playing it on, like, honor of claws or something and then a 5-2 trading with the unit and making them discard a card is basically the same as this card so this card isn't as good as i thought it was when you put it that way but i still think that this card is going to be like if there is a dedicated discard deck i think that this is going to be a good part of it and by the way we need a better term for this than voided like <laughs> we need something that evokes the coming from the void not going to the void i think I think void's a perfectly fine term, but if, if anyone has any better terminology in mind, they can, you know, shoot me a message or put a message somewhere. And uh, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll change my terminology. I am open to suggestions, although I still like the term. Narcomoeba. Narco. No, 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 no. Definitely not that. <laughs> uh notably, this card also has uh, fun interactions with Short Hopper. Short Hopper being the four fire oh, yeah. primal four four that says when you summon it, you get to check a spell from your Mark it to the bin. If it's odd, it gets flying. If it's even, it gets plus two attack. Previously, we've had Icy Gaze and Privilege of Rank as sort of discards. Uh, now we have Icy Gaze and Send a Message. So if you have a six power, two of it being the Shadow Influence, obviously, you can play Short Hopper and discard Send a Message to get a 4-4 a four, four Flyer plus the Send a Message bonus. Uh, this is going to be very relevant in, I think, Expedition specifically, because Expedition is A, a slower format, and B, Expedition has less useful ways to use the market. You know, the best way to use the market is Grafter, I mean, Vine Grafter is a great card, but all the other Grafters are, you know, like, they're worse than Vine Grafter. Vine Grafter is already, you know, not the most efficient card ever, right? It's not super efficient. It's still five to go to the market. It has all the downsides still that we outlined back in the original spoiler review, or I think that Sunny outlined to me specifically. <laughs> I think I was a little higher on Grafters than I perhaps should have been. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if the market's not as useful as Expedition, but you do have Short Hopper, and Short Hopper can get Icy Gay, Send a Message, or Privilege of Rank. Choosing a short hopper market could be the way to go over choosing a grafter market just because the market's so much worse in expedition. Yeah, this card's also very good. You know, having to pay two though does hold it back in my opinion compared to, you know, doing it for free. But still an incredibly powerful effect. And both of these cards are still cheap enough in some respects compared to, say, Felrock, where you're not like thrilled to play it for straight up value, but like it's still not the end of the world, right? Like you're, you know, in the in a tough bind, you know, making your opponent discard a card and sacrifice unit can just still be great if they have one unit in play it's still really a good unit you know you're not going to be unhappy to get that two for one and clear their big unit out of the way so something that i need to point out is that we have a lot of these effects that mm -hmm. uh, play as you discard them mm -hmm. previously we basically just had two privilege of rank and fell rock and both were like very good when they were good now you don't have the issue that you know fell rock and privilege of rank are too like they're not compatible because of the decks that they go in. Now you have a lot more compatibility with these cards, and I'm I'm really scared about what is going to show up. One previous card that we didn't really have, it was sort of a fake card because it didn't really exist because it never saw play, was Faceless One. Faceless One being the uh, one cost 2-1 in Shadow, that if you have a Shadow Influence and it is voided, uh, you just play it for free. The big problem with that was obviously that it couldn't block, and not blocking is the reason that Gren was terrible. Uh, but Faceless One's now suddenly a lot better because 
one terminology that I like to call again and again is critical mass, right? When you have a critical mass of these of these voided cards, of these cards that benefit from you milling yourself or discarding, then it's just it's so much better to have just enough doing that. Especially when you have cards like Elding that actively benefit from you just having a bunch of free random units in play, right? So you get a free unit in play with Faceless One to be useful for other things such as Elding. So even previous cards suddenly get new shines of playability they used to have. Yeah. All right, moving on, we have... This is a really interesting one. It makes all other stealth cards a lot better. <laughs> Subversion Slug, a five cost, a single shadow, six four, stealth. Ultimate, when the enemy player plays a spell directly on Subversion Slug, reveal it to negate that spell, then steal it and play it from the void. So this is to punish anyone that's trying to remove well, one of the many units that we've talked about that want to stick around for one turn before getting their effect off of stealth. And uh, Void, is it punishing? Notably, this only hides any five-cost stealth unit. If your deck's only playing two stealth units and one cost three, one cost five, they will know what Subversion Slug is. But if you are playing even two stealth units, which I think that there's really going to be two ways to go about stealth. It's either go all in on stealth that way and try to use some stealth payoffs or you just play two, maybe three stealth cards. You go like four, four, or maybe like four, three, one, depending, something like that. And then you just basically give your opponent a choice, right? You know, you give your opponent a fork. And in this case, the version slug becomes the single most important stealth card in the game at the five cost slot because it gives your opponent the biggest delta in choices. Specifically, if you're playing, say, Shadow Expedition, if you see a five cost stealth come out of your opponent and their shadow, is it Subversion Slug? Is it Elding? If it's Elding, you want to kill that, uh, especially if it's like their only card or whatever. You don't want that to hit you. But if it's Subversion Slug, then you don't want to kill it because then you'll you know lose your spell. This applies to even like the last Carnosaurs and is the other great example, right? If you're playing against Xenon, they yeah. play a five cost stealth unit. Is it Slug or is it Carnosaur? If you throw a removal at it, Slug, you could just lose the game. But if you don't throw a removal at it, it's Carnosaur, you could just lose the game. So this card's the single most important <laughs> stealth card in the game. Yeah. A way to get around that is the ambitious Mandevilla that we talked about. It's yeah. not a spell. <laughs> yeah. And it survives. Yeah, ambitious Mandevilla does become a negative one, one. So it does survive to be recurred back in the future. <laughs> uh, but the thing around it is ping effects, right? If you throw like a Vara's favor at this, or I guess ruinous burst would be the best way, because Vara's favor, they still get some value out of it. If they steal a ruinous burst, you might be a lot happier than stealing that. Or you stop, say, the, um, the Carnosaur effect, right? If you throw like a one damage burn spell, at Carnosaur, you remove it stealth. If you so one badge burn stealth, version slug, they get the spell, but it, hopefully it's not too de game destroying on your end. So that would be the real way to play around these five cost stealth cards. Anyways, speaking of cards that are super interesting and potentially game changing, Fall to Ruin is six shadow, shadow, shadow. So that's not that's not that easy of an influence. Uh, I know people say influence is free, but it's it is less free than people give credit for. Uh, Fall to Ruin is a six cost with triple shadow spell. Kill all units, which is just one more than Harshal, but if you have 12 or more units in your void, only kill the enemy unit. So that becomes a one-sided Harshal. So it becomes like a pristine light that you don't have to like set up any weirdness to. 12 units is a lot, though. It's only late game. You know, if you've played with Kato, you know that Kato doesn't turn online that quickly. You know that it's great when it does, but it's never, ever early game. And six is a lot, and it is one more than Harshal, and Harshal currently doesn't see like any play in Thrones. Well, something to note is that all of the harsh rule effects have been justice, right? This is a harsh yep. rule effect that doesn't require any justice, and that's been something that the game just doesn't have. And that adds just another angle to the like faction identity of Shadow. Are we going to be able to get 12 units in your void? Uh, that seems really tough. It's pretty good when it does happen. Most notably, probably going to happen like if you're playing some sort of even reanimator deck, for example. I think that is an example of where you might see that actually happen. But just the fact that we have a harsh rule that's in shadow, I think is a big deal, even if it is not nearly as good as harsh rule, of course. It just, it just, it changes things. Yeah, back in the day, I played straight into shadows because I had to. It was the only option, and I think it was the correct choice to play, and it served me well in that one ECQ. But it was no harsh rule. Like, I would have loved to have harsh rule in the deck. I would have loved to have fall in that deck. When I say this, this fundamentally changes the game, it's because it opens up shadow to new options like oh it opens up everything new options in some respects like for example you know if you're playing uh some sort of control deck you can move more into shadow you, you can leave dust behind right like previously you know x control was one of the 
premier control decks, and that's because it had access to Harsh Rule. Uh, it has access to other things, too, that might make it still, you know, the viable option with, like, such as Defiance and Stormholt Knife and still Harsh Rule being, you know, one cost less. But there's also other avenues. For instance, you know, like Volatility, right? My One of my favorite decks I built, my Sea of Teeth Volatility deck, couldn't have branched out into other factions because it really needed to have a Harsh Rule effect to grab with Volatility. Now, potentially, it can try going into Shadow instead of Justice. And you thought, Sonny, you thought that I was going to miss out on Volatility this whole time. But nope. I got to bring it up at least once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the double justice and volatility decks always really hurts. Yeah, that's why I said this was not free. Uh, influence is not free, as people like to say. Yeah, but like, there are shadow dragons that you like to play. Not that I'm condoning volatility, but like, <laughs> it just changes you things. Like, that's, what, that's what we're saying. Yes, exactly. Okay, the next card is our first multifaction card, Malaga Amphitheater. It's a three cost, a fire time sight. It has two starting health. When one or more of your units hits the enemy player, replenish power equal to this site's uh, health. Diogo's agenda, this is the three-faction Diogo, the one that's part of the combo, is Mind Fire, Slow, and Daring Maneuver. Uh, I thought it was the Praxis Diogo, the one with charge that is ultimate eight. Is it true? It's possible I looked at it wrong. Uh, let's double check it live on air. Oh, wait, you're right, you're right, you're right. It is the, it is the Praxis Diogo. Yeah, it's the Praxis site, so it's got the Praxis Diogo, which is better for the card. A lot better. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that this is really cool. Like, I can imagine a play pattern of, you know, you playing out a unit on turn one and or two, or maybe just turn one. Like, you go Initiative Sands into Malaga Amphitheater, whatever they play, you just mind fire it to get through, and then you have two more power to do anything with to protect it. Like, I think this is a huge deal. It's it just like... After that first turn, you threaten to get so far ahead by slowing your opponent and then getting through again, and then you have access to, like, six power or whatever to just dump out your hand. And that's usually what Praxis decks want to do, I think. And then Diogo can attack the turn that you play him, and maybe you can get up to the eight power. Like, if you're on turn six oh, and you hit them, yeah, you might be able to activate Diogo. But, I mean, even without that, I think that this is just such a great way for Praxis decks to get ahead which is kind of their identity in like power generation that uh i think that this is going to make a big splash at least as far as praxis cards can because we haven't seen a real praxis deck for a while <laughs> i thought i was gonna love this card when i saw it uh it's a one cost site basically if, if you're not getting your power back when you play this then you're probably losing the game straight up so don't worry about that part of it because this card gives you both mind fire and daring maneuver as options on the agenda so if you can't get through with a unit when you play it, then again, you're just probably going to lose the game because you either don't have units or your opponent has too much of a board advantage. Uh, on turn three, it should very easily just, you know, cost one. And, you know, it costs one, it transforms the game in many ways. Its biggest downside, of course, is that it's the Praxis factions, and we haven't seen Praxis do so well recently. Time is a faction that hasn't done well recently. So we'll see if this card can revitalize a, you know, faction that hasn't been doing well recently i think i mean it could this card is really powerful i really like the card i mean i like a site wow who would have thought <laughs> speaking of practice cards that are almost certainly will make less of a splash but are just fun enough to bring up and interesting enough to bring up marshall uh Izai. so i guess this is Izai chi i think this is probably the same person it is six fire fire time time for a two two flying which is super over costed for its stats but it has a really impressive summon. Summon, play two 6-6 six, six Sentinels. So for six, you get the 2-2 two, two Flyer and two 6-6s. Six, but its downside is that if, if Marshall Ezai goes away with Entomb, all your Sentinels perish. So it's got some beef, but it's got a pretty big downside. Yeah, if there's any way to take out the downside, this card could be huge because that is 14 attack and health split over three bodies yep. for six. And I mean, if you're playing a Praxis deck, like you're probably ramping. So it's not completely unreasonable to get this out ahead of schedule. We don't have Sling of the Chi in Expedition anymore, thankfully. But Sling of the Chi would like this, right? That's two triggers for Sling of the Chi. <laughs> the other way to utilize this, you know, you have sort of, I guess there's kind of two options in my head. You have the self-silence, right? Where you, if you silence it, uh, yeah, you lose its flying, but you get to keep all your bodies. And that's really what matters, right? The other way is to take advantage of things like Inferno Den. If all of them have charge, just charging in for 14 surprise damage, that could be really big. Oh, there's another angle is which if you could somehow transform it. Oh, yeah, I didn't think of that one. Yeah, I don't know if there's a good way to do that. But, you know, that's that's a thought. 
if you can get rid of that Atum effect on it, this card has some serious legs. Yep, absolutely. The next card is Pisto Ever Turning. This is a Rakana card, double fire, double justice, six cost, six, six. When the enemy player plays a spell, deal three damage to them. At the end of your turn, and if you have no cards in hand, draw three cards. This is an interesting one. I think the factions that it's in is going to hurt it, but I've seen cards like this actually succeed in other card games. Granted, Eternal is not that spell based, but it's not too hard to think of like, if Machinations combo is big, they can't really effectively beat this card if you land it. And we were talking about an eight class card that can beat Machinations by itself. This one is a six cost card. Granted, it's also not time, so you don't get the same uh, acceleration that you do all other words. But like, it's just a card worth knowing, I think, because it does something pretty unique. And it's a way to just like put your shields down against the Machinations combo deck and expect to win. So while I was saying all that, I was like sticking out my tongue, rolling my eyes, giving it a big thumbs down, like blah, 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 this card's bad. And I still kind of think that, but I didn't think about its interaction with Machinations combo and perhaps other spell decks, because versus Machinations combo, it basically either says your opponent, you know, has six or nine less life to play with for mock combo. You know, they don't want to die to themselves. So, you know, Overloader plus Hardiness plus Machinations plus Pyrotech, that's three spells. That would be nine damage. Now, mind you, once if you're playing this, it means since it's cost six, one, if they're on the play, especially if they're on the draw, whatever, uh, you know, they could already combo it off on turn five or six, but we can even play this out. So that's kind of like a bleh. But also on turn six, it means that, you know, maybe they can just have seven power and then they can play just, you know, machinations with pyrotech and then they only lose six life off this. And then that's, you know, a lot less and that can give them enough life to, you know, win the game with. So this card would be good in a fair metagame, but we have not seen quite a fair mid-range six drop fest for quite some time. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving this my thumbs down. It just fulfills like a really unique role is all I'm saying. Thumbs down. Okay. <laughs> uh, next card is not a thumbs down. Next card is, I mean, I'm hoping Sunny thinks this is a thumbs up. It seems like a Sunny kind of card. Uh, this is two fire primal for a two, two Grenadine. Summon, you get to choose whether it has Aegis or quick draw. And when you attack with exactly two units, prowling Amaruk gets plus two attack. So against a, a control deck with had lots of removal, you give this Aegis, and against a deck with a lot of units, you give this Quick Draw. And both those options seem really powerful to me, so I like this card a lot. Yeah, it's worth noting that Aegis and Quick Draw are both very powerful, but like when one is good, the other is not, right? It's usually either one is good or the other is good in an aggro deck. So the fact that you get to choose when you play this, I think is a big deal. Uh, and if you play it on turn two, like if you attack with this and Milos on turn three, you, you're attacking with Milos, which is great, but you're also expecting to either hit them for four or make them chump block because um, either you used quick draw and they have units, so they have to block, like they can't interact with it with units, or they are playing a spell based like deck to protect themselves. And in that case, Aegis is really good. So, yeah, I do like this card. This is a sunny card. I'm glad. I, like, <laughs> I thought it was a sunny card. I was waiting for the, the ball to drop, but I was like, this, this absolutely. It seems aggressive. It gives you options, so I know you like skill testing options that allow you to, you know, be good at the game. Uh, everyone loves being good at the game. And, uh, you know, it's like a 4-2, right? You can pretty reliably assume that this is... I mean, you can't maybe think it's a 6-2, but like a 4-2 is pretty reliable to assume this card will be. On attacks, obviously. You can trigger this on turn 2 with Lumen Shepherd or Grenadine Drone, uh, but most likely than not, it will be triggered on turn 3. If you're playing on turn 2, that is. I do think that the attack with exactly two units, a lot of that text is really inconsistent or like unreliable, I guess is where I'm looking for, for most of the cards that's on. But I think this one's better because you can expect to get a safe attack with the abilities it has. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Next card is the new Stonescar Hotness Skullbreaker. Two cost, fire, shadow, three, two, overwhelm, deadly on your turn. This strikes me as being like a Dark Blade Cut Purse, except... Um, it doesn't die to pain, so this might <laughs> see the same uh, change that we had to that one. And it's also easier to play, um, because I think a lot of the time this is going to be attacking in, and it's going to trade with something and deal two damage to them as it trades. Yeah, absolutely. I think this card is great. It's just absurdly solid, right? Unlike, you know, a lot of other cards, this card will play roughly the same every time, and it will play really well every time. You know, you just kind of attack with it always, you know. 
if only had reckless you could just you know not make mistakes with the card basically assume this card is reckless and you'll probably be better off you know this card is easier to play than cut purse cut purse being double fire was significant being say a four two or a five two overwhelm is maybe roughly about the same amount of damage that a three two deadly will deal if it's blocked the only reason this card might skip the the one health nerf that a lot of these aggressive three twos often become uh is that the floor and the ceiling for this card are about the same every time right always going to be the same but it's always going to be solid unlike cut purse where the ceiling was i'm going to attack with an eight two on turn four and that was really disgusting a lot of the time this card is just always just a three two though so i think this card could survive uh but i again would not be surprised if it did end up getting one health treatment that card really wishes that we had one cost uh rapid shot the yeah. plus four attack yes. and quick draw that would be the dream do have though the two cost plus two attack weapon that comes with quick draw for the turn so you play that you get in for four damage and then you still have a five two deadly overwhelm for the future yeah maybe still cost twice as much though it's true that is a big deal but expedition though obviously expedition everything changes and expedition is a lot weaker for formats i'm not sure about throne if there's a stone card deck in throne this card will definitely be a part of it and expedition i think that trick in expedition is very solid just two cost plus two attack permanently plus quick draw for the turn i think that's a good card in expedition yeah blocking is not going to be fun uh this next card i put down although uh the more i look at it the more i'm like why did i put this down <laughs> feels just like a draft card to me in some respects but like it's got a dream, so I'm going to mention it anyways. Uh, this is four Fire Shadow for a 2-4 Deadly Valkyrie. And as an ultimate, when a relic goes to a void, so whether it be yours or your opponent's, whether it be discarded or from play, or relic weapon that you know is destroyed, uh, Disgrace Cadet gets plus three attack and flying. So if you pull off the little side quest, you get a 5-4 Deadly Flyer for four power, which is okay, although perhaps not spectacular for the hoops you might have to jump through. Yeah, I mean, five attack deadly is not a huge deal most of the time because it usually all right kills whatever it's going in combat with. Like the dream is not that hard. The quest is not necessarily that hard to fulfill. Like I was thinking rocket blaster sacrifices relics, sure. so that would be a way to do it. But like then it becomes an impending doom, right? Or blitzstone and you get to attack with the six. Five. Yeah, but it was impending doom or I mean, the card I was thinking of was that dragon, the four fire fire dragon. That's a five four that you know, gives your top deck minus four cost, oh, yeah. right? That card. You know, while you say that the hope's not hard to jump through, and that's true, you still have to jump through a hoop to get a decent card, right? Like, Impending Doom's a playable card, but like, if I had to jump through a hoop to get Impending Doom, you know, that's much less playable. Yeah. This card in draft, though, will be a huge deal. It's no metal thing, but this card in draft will be just like a really good card. So, moving on, the Combray now. I don't know if we we're going through every one of the factions, but just to clarify, every faction does get at least four cards. They get a common, an uncommon, a rare, and a blueprint, and then five of them get a legendary as well. But not every faction is created equal, and not every, you know, card in each rarity slot or whatever is going to be the same. Yeah. Uh, we're just testing the best one. Faction pair. Yeah. So, on to the Combray stuff, we have a uh, Gavel's Insight, and it is one time justice for a fast spell. Give a unit plus two, plus two, and overwhelm this turn. Amplify two, kill an enemy relic. So a cheap, effective combat trick that also has flexibility in killing relics such as Sling of the Chi, Rat Cage, or whatever other relics coveted, uh, Gemstone if you're an expedition. Yeah, this card seems super solid in a Combra aggro deck. You know, easy, easy, just simple card, good, cheap, effective, and flexible. Yeah, and the fact that it gives Overwhelm, that's an effect that Combra aggro likes to have. I mean, there's already Omri's Choice, but Omri's Choice is like really good in a lot of the decks that it's in. So. Yeah, I mean, Finest Tower, but that probably works out to be better than Finest Tower because of Teacher of Humility and uh, just the fact that Combray doesn't have a lot of reach, generally speaking. And like the kill enemy relics text is like so stapled on, but I mean, that's going to come up and it's going to be good when it does. Yeah, but if it was like kill an enemy relic, you know, the unit gets an extra plus one plus one this turn or something then it would feel less stapled on. As is, yeah. yes, it does It does feel like the classic eternal text of like doing something else when it's like, maybe it should tell a better story, right? Like, what's the story here? But who can say? So speaking of Combray Aggro, this next card is an interesting one. Terius, Martial Master, is a three-cost uh, Combray card, single time, single justice. It's a 3-3 Awakened Soldier, has Aegis and Valor. 
When Terius hits the enemy player, create and draw a 1-1 Awakened with Valor. This does a lot of things that I really like. It has Aegis, so it has some protection from spells. It has Valor, so it's going to be difficult to block. And it draws cards, kind of. At least you can use those cards for plundering or going to the market. So I think that this is this is a sneaky good card. This is like a nice card to have if you're an aggro deck and nothing really exists that's quite like it. Yeah, it's reasonably hard to interact with, right? Because you can't really hit it with spells and you can't really block because it is Valor. Although you can because you can, you know, double hit a spell. Bar is favor, Torch, it still gets through there. Valor obviously means it's slightly hard to block, but you can still block it because, you know, you put a 4-4 in front of it and you trade, you're probably still happy. You put a 5-5, you're probably still happy. Although this card combines well with combat tricks. In fact, all Valor cards combine well with combat tricks because you combine this card with Gavel's Insight then suddenly it's a blocking nightmare. Because then you need a 6-6 six, six to block. And if you know your opponent has Finest Hour or Gavel's Insight, and you have this card, and you're just to decide, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to throw in front of it, right? You don't want to throw your 4-4 four, four, and then have it die to a one-cost spell or something. So uh, combines both the combat tricks. The one ones Awaken with Valor are probably not that good, or rather Sunny said they weren't good earlier, so I'm going to say they're not good now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess the biggest downside is that, you know, while it does a lot, it doesn't punch for a lot, per se, right? It's only hitting for three a turn, rather than, you know, it doesn't have, like, charge or overwhelm or gets bigger with life, still like Milos. And the one ones with Valor, you know, so you said, are not going to attack for the most, right? You can use them for well, card advantage purposes, yeah, but, like... They're not going to attack, but it's, like... I've played a lot of Combri aggro decks. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that is constantly an issue is that you just don't have good market fodder. You don't have cards like Joe or like Crawl or like Yoden Hurler that are good at going to the market. So, do you think this... So, uh, I, I, I do understand what you're saying. I just, I just want to ask a question, though. Do you think that this could make Combri aggro viable in Throne? Because in Expedition, markets kind of don't really exist anymore in, in many ways. So having access to market fodder is less important in Expedition than it is in Throne in many ways. It'll be interesting. Like, I mean, maybe this paves the way for like a Fearless Crescendo deck. That's sure. a card that like you usually can't play in these types of decks because you don't have the fodder in order to recoup the card loss. And also, also you don't have the, the the sort of supreme unit to put it on in some respects as far as, I mean, you could put on like a, a Teacher of Humility and then that's obviously really good. But like, you know, putting on like a three drop, you don't really be putting it on a um, Orc Record Keeper, for instance, because they can just kill and then you got two for one. But if you put it on an Aegis unit, you know, then it's always a two for two. But you have probably more efficiency with your power that you use than they use, and you got a market pull, uh, which is always a good tempo. So, yeah, maybe. All right. I don't think this next card is playable, so why don't you go ahead? Okay, so this card fits into the tier 2.5 stealth deck that I've sort of been suggesting exists throughout all of this, roughly speaking. Saying, like, if there's a stealth deck, it's going to have this. If there's nothing to this, this is part of the tier 2.5 stealth deck. This is the linchpin. If you're playing all the stealth cards, you're playing this card. This is Ring of Glamour. It is two time primal for a relic. When you play a unit with stealth, draw a card. After the third usage of this, you sacrifice Ring of Glamour to gain three life. So, drawing three cards for two power, Sunny will admit that is a powerful effect. Obviously, the downside is you have to be playing a bunch of stealth units, which, you know, you may not want to play a whole deck with stealth units if your one single goal is, you know, have the highest win rate possible. But if your goal is to have a reasonable win rate, have some fun playing stealth units, have fun just confusing your opponent with a bunch of stealth units. There are worse things to do in Eternal in this card. You know, Expedition Stealth deck will be basically the linchpin of that makes it a thing. Is it going to be a tier one? No. Is it going to be terrible? Probably not. So there you go. Useful to know about. So one reason why I don't think the stealth deck is going to work is because everything will cost three and five, right? We've talked about how important it is to have power curves. And yeah, I guess there are ways of like, decreasing the cost of stealth cards but like in order to make these stealth matters payoffs work is you just have to jam a bunch of three drops and a bunch of five drops into your deck and that's not going to work as well as doing the even-handed golem thing of jamming a bunch of two drops and a bunch of four drops into a deck i mean they're one cost cells that might be different but yes the, i mean that that's so the outline that is the biggest problem is that you know it's kind of tempo inefficient in some ways to be playing stealth cards because you have to construct your deck around these class of cards that all most of the time will cost a little bit more expensive than, you know, maybe other cards you want to do. Again, that's why I don't think it'll be Tier 1. I'm hopeful that Daryl made it a Tier 2.5 deck. I also think that if the Stealth deck, if the deck thing, you know, 100% Stealth units was a Tier 1 deck, it probably wouldn't be very good for the game as a whole, 
which is why I think that Daryl, you know, did not make it so because it would be very annoying to always be playing against, you know, every card in their deck was hidden information you had to think about every single time. That would be very tiring to have that happen again and again. Yeah, and you'll get punished without knowing like what yeah, card they have. Exactly. Having these fork opportunities where you next play a couple of stealth units, that's a little bit more reasonable. That's why I think that, you know, having it be a reasonable option, sure. That's why I think that not being tier one is perfectly acceptable as well. All right, the next one's a fun one. Mandatory retirement shows a guy like playing a flute, I think. I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, anyway, <laughs> two cost a legion card, single time, single primal. It's a slow speed spell. Transform an enemy unit or relic into a 2-1 fresh recruit. So kind of like an equivocate that is slow and they get the unit right away and it's always bad. Yep, basically. It's, uh, it's a lot worse than equivocate because they get it right away. I guess you could play it with Mist Helm in some respects because it's a way to transform Mist Helm into a unit. No, enemy unit. Oh, it's enemy unit. Okay, never mind. You can't, you can't even play with Mist Helm. Uh, I, mean, I mean, that's probably for the best because then you're using a bad card to create a slightly less bad card and a good card, and that's, you know, not the best interaction. Maybe it's important Expedition, just because Expedition might have worse removal, so a bad Equivocate might be necessary there, but obviously in Throne, where we actually have straight-up Equivocate, this card should not see any play, but in Expedition, maybe it's got a shot. I don't know. Yeah, flexibility is kind of nice, but I think it's straight just isn't good enough. All right, the next card, if you were looking for an answer... Oh, wait, wait, wait sorry, we have wait, an wait. announcement first. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to discuss this card just a different application because we kind of gave it a short change a little bit last time but also an announcement uh if you remember avar the sort of combo enabler uh in xenon from last time the 2-1 for two time shadow units cost two less when you play the unit the enemy player plays a minus two minus one curse on it that card is no longer named avara and it's now called imar the sort of prevalent theory is that's because if you were to type Vara into the search box, you know, it should because the card's name is Avara. Also, people are uh, speculating that, you know, they changed it to prevent lore spoilers because maybe this is actual Vara coming to the future, right? <laughs> Avara. I'm not so sure about that. It's not like Direwolf has, you know, been shy at making card names suggest lore spoilers in the past. Do you remember, uh, what is it, Trav? What was, what was the Horus Trav? What did he anagram to that was part of Flame of Zorta? Barrett, yeah. Barrett. I mean, they had Barrett, which is obviously, you know, Traver, right? So it's not like Daryl has been hesitant to, you know, put lore spoilers on the front of their card. Um, but yeah, this card did get a name change, which is funny. Uh, I do want to bring this briefly, uh, once again, because last time we discussed fair uses of the card, we did not discuss combo uses of the card, pretty much, which is to say that you play this, and then you immediately win the game, utilizing it in some capacity, whether that be through uh, playing infinite... That reckless 2-1 with bargain, invasive species, right? You play infinite invasive species, get invasive death or on play triggers, and then you win the game. Or you play like infinite Shadowlands guides that cost one each, so you can keep recurring them from the void back and forth. Or some other combo way to infinitely win the game. The other way you can play this card. And I think it's also not very good. Uh, you know, it seems inconsistent. It seems not as good as other combo options you have available in the game. But I felt like we'd be remiss if we did not bring up the other side of uh, Amar now. Um, so just bringing up the other side is the flip side to playing barely is playing unfairly and either seems inefficient, inconsistent, and not as good as other options you have in the game. Yes, I agree. All right, on to a card that I think a lot of people will be happy to have exist. This is Freeze Out, two cost, guru card, justice and primal. It's a fast spell that says negate an enemy spell. The enemy player can't play spells this turn. So this will actually stop the machinations combo, assuming they don't have condemn for their fast negate that they have. But yeah, this is an interesting way to make it so that, you know, even though people get the power right away from Diabolic Machinations, they can't use it because they can't play another spell that turn. Yeah, this is useful because, you know, sometimes you would say like negate Diabolic Machinations and then they just play Power Tech Explosion for those already in their hand. Or they just Machinations for 10 and then they have another Machinations waiting in case you counter the first one, right? This stops it and gives you an extra turn to either apply more pressure or if they did machinations for the full amount, you know, it just stops it completely because once they're at one, it's so much harder for them to win. Notably, this also is super, super important is uh, in one specific deck, in one specific way, this is a negate effect you can put into a justice market. Previously, we've had zero ways to negate cards. Well, I mean, 
really suboptimal ways, like Island's Choice or something. Uh, is Island's Choice the three-cost one that negates, like, a four-cost spell? Either way, super not yeah. relevant ways to negate things in Justice. But now we have this two-cost, easy answer that even prevents spells. This is a card that Huru Kira would love in the market. It's a different, unique effect that they can use to help shore up certain decks and certain matchups. So, obviously, other Justice sort of based aggro decks and like Huru or whatever, you know, or just Justice markets in general, they're also playing Primal. A very important thing to keep in mind if you're building a Huru Dex Evermore. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was where I was going with this card also. <laughs> Unsurprising, <laughs> considering we both played Huru yeah. <laughs> here at the last. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, next card. This one's going to be a big one. I think this, this is the good one, is uh, Collapse. This is a two-cost Argentport fast spell. Single justice, single shadow. Discard a card to kill an enemy unit, curse, or sight. I think this is the good discard enabler because this card is great mm-hmm. and it enables your discard uh, synergies if you need them. Yeah, this card is cheap and it's effective. It kills not every deck plays units, curse, or sights, but most decks play at least one of these three. And uh, it, it's cheap and effective, right? You don't get much cheaper than two cost to kill something. Yes, you could play one. And we did have a period of time where we did have a zero cost kill a unit. Rest in peace, bring the justice. You'll be missed. <laughs> or maybe you won't be missed. I don't know. But yeah, this card costs two and it kills anything, right? On like Annihilate or Send an Agent. This kills, you know, anything. It does not kill relics that kill relic weapons or other attachments. It only kills curses. But even still, super efficient. It combines well, obviously, with every discard outlet, especially uh, you take card like Send a Message. If you're playing an expensive discard outlet, that card's less effective, but it really combines well with collapse because, you know, if your opponent has two units in play, you're going to kill both of them. Does that work? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had it played against me today. I've only played like 10, 15 games of Eternal today, but... um. Okay, so you, you can't sacrifice the one that they're... Nope, nope. Okay. My opponent played Collapse and Send a Message, and they killed one unit, and I had to sacrifice the other. And then I discarded a card. So um, it did cost four for that little exchange, right? So it's not like I was too heavily punished. Because, you know, they paid four basically to kill two units to make me discard a card. But um, it wasn't not effective either. I was like, oh, I kind of got three for two in a sense. Effective, yeah. cheap, just very solid. Seems great in like the reanimator deck. If, if oh, you yeah. ever want to play an Argentport reanimator deck with the uh, life for a life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for those of you who uh, don't remember, important card life for a life. For just a shadow, for a spell that says sacrifice a unit to play another unit from your void, it gets void bound. And that card is also going to see a lot of play. Uh, very important to keep in mind with all these discard things, right? You discard a big fatty, and then you can reanimate it out. Speaking of things to discard, ways to utilize Collapse or, say, Sky Snapper or one of the other cards from above, uh, we have Dionglo Racketeers or Justice Shadow for a 3-2 Rogue. Obviously, you're never wanting to play this face up because then you're sad. But when it goes to your Void, you may pay 2 to play a 4-3 back alley bouncer. So when it's voided, you get to pay 2 and you get to make a 4-3. Now, notably, this card does not have an influence requirement on its voided text. So you could play this in an all-primal deck. You could play this in just a shadow deck or a felon deck even. You don't have to be playing Justice to make use of this text. This card seems mostly like an expedition card to me, but there it seems very powerful. as just a nice, tempo-efficient way to make a board state while you're discarding things. Yeah, you definitely don't want to play this fairly. I didn't realize it was if he goes to your void in any way. So mm-hmm. I thought it was just like when it dies. So nope. <laughs> that's a lot worse. But yeah, that does seem like it'll have some application. The next one, Surprise Raid. Surprise. Surprise. Uh, two cost felon card. Primal Shadow. Life Steal deals two damage to an enemy. If you have a hidden unit, I suppose that's one that is stealth that your opponent can't see yet. Draw a card. Yeah, this card's not that great it's the reason that if you're playing of the all stealth deck you might move into knowledge rather than just being just elysian because the rate of deal to life steal uh draw a card is is really powerful that is a really powerful effect the downside is that you have to have a hidden unit specifically not just a unit with stealth and also the curve doesn't really work out that well i guess you won't be that unhappy to like say kill the opponent's three two attacker or their dionglo hound master whatever you know, gain two life in the process. But obviously, you know, unlike the, uh, the the Elysian Relic from above, you know, you can't curve this into a hidden unit. You have to play this after the hidden unit if you want to draw a card. So it's fine. If you're playing the stealth deck, you'll play this probably if you're playing the shadow stealth deck, that is. Um, maybe it just sees playing Expedition anyways, because maybe removal is lacking. And, you know, you're like, oh, maybe I'll get an upside with my Subversion Slug or something. But overall, mm, eh. 
I'm going to move on to a actual good felon card, although I'm going to guess Sonny doesn't think this card is that good. Or maybe he does. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to put it down. Predicting Sonny doesn't think this card is good. Uh, three Primal Shadow for a 3-1 Grenadine Sloth with Stealth. Uh, this is the overprotective ant of the ever-growing Grenadine family. So our little ant over here has Stealth, so it's hidden until otherwise revealed. And as in two, play 1-1-1 one, one, one Razor Blot with Deadly. And when Foraging Tri-To hits the enemy player, you increase its Intomb by one. So the easiest play pattern, the way that this card is some sort of base level design, is that because the opponent doesn't know what it is, they let it go through, and then they see it and it's revealed, and then suddenly you get two one ones with Deadly. It's like, oh my goodness, uh, look how spooky that is. But yeah, so I thought this card was like kind of whatever until I played the preview event where you get two free stealth units. It just did a lot of work when I was just playing it on turn three, just because, yeah, I mean, yes, it was free, and yes, it guaranteed that I was able to play on three, but overall, it just was pretty good at what it was doing. You know, it oftentimes made two or three Grenadines, especially if I had removal in hand to clear blockers away, and, you know, if they poured removal at it, I always got value, and if you're playing a Grenadine deck, you know, just having the critical mass of Grenadines, especially Grenadines that leave behind more Grenadines, so... Uh, good old uh, solid B, B plus for my little Grenadine aunt over here. Overprotective, she protects all of her nieces and nephews until she needs to let them leave the nest. I have a really hard time imagining this getting more than one <laughs> Razorbot. Like, boy, connecting with the three cost three one is really tough. Even if your opponent doesn't know that it's a three one, they probably have something that can block it or remove it that will be going up on tempo. But it didn't in the preview event. Okay. <laughs> I don't think the preview event is very uh, representative <laughs> of like a normal constructed environment. Anyway, um, like it's good enough to have just like a three one that leaves behind a one one. Maybe that's fine, but I think that's about it. I think that base rate is good enough. Like if that base rate wasn't good enough, then I wouldn't like the card. But I think the base rate is probably good enough. And I think that getting two, probably not three, but like I think that getting two one ones out of it, I don't think is that unlikely. And I'd also argue that it getting multiple 1-1s one -ones with Deadly in the preview event is even more interesting, in my opinion, because the opponent is guaranteed to have a 3-drop that can block it, potentially. Right? They're guaranteed to have a 3-drop in hand. So if they have the power, they can play a 3-drop on the battlefield. But it impressed me enough in there that I think that it is, especially you know now that, like say, for example, Assembly Line has left Expedition. Without Assembly Line Expedition, you, know, you need some more Grenons to shore up any Grenadin-based deck, like Tessa. This card is very solid. I think can do just that. Go little aunt. All right, we'll see. I mean, <laughs> I'm very skeptical. All right, last card that we have for today is a legendary in Felon. It's five cost, a shadow primal, one four, deadly valor stealth, Sindar the Corruptor. When Sindar hits the enemy player, play a Sindar's mark on them. When someone has three Sindar's mark, they lose the game. So I think what you're going to have to do with this one is either figure out a way so that it can ping the opponent or give it berserk, like getting it off of the primal grafter um, is kind of interesting because then you only need to hit them twice, basically. You hit them once and then berserk and then hit, try to hit them uh, a second time. Yeah, hitting them three times is kind of tough, but it does stack with multiples of the card as well. So like, you know, if the opponent has two marks on them and your Sindar dies and then you play another one down the road, then it can kill them. But that also just like, might not get enough for the attack, especially for five. That might not be worth it. Meh. I mean, like, if you attack three times the World Bear Behemoth... I hope you win that game, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like, like think, think of, like, That's any true. five drop, you know, if you attack three times the Moonstone Vanguard, like, this card's a 2-5 deadly, right? So if they block, it's 2-5 deadly, or they can just chump block it, right? If they play assembly line, they can just chump it three times. If you play assembly line into a Moonstone Vanguard or a World Bear Behemoth, you're not in great shape. Yeah, okay. If you play multiples, it's interesting, but overall, if we ever get, like, more good cheap ice bow effects, it's possible, but overall, this card's just... Bleh. Okay, you're right, yeah. I was seduced by the alternate win condition. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, moving on, we're gonna go over uh, some of our top fives. Before we do, I'd just like to give some honorable mentions, because this cast is not long enough yet. I would like to give an honorable mention to Blitstone, uh, one of my favorite commons that everyone seems to think is awful, and I'm like, no! It's cute, and it's got some fun synergy outlooks, and I want to play it and have fun with it. So, shout out to having fun. Uh, also, Open Way Supplier. I think that card could potentially be very good if time wasn't quite so rough. Kind of didn't get very much in the way of, of the set this time as well. Uh, Valiant doesn't really count as a time card because 
if you're playing it with reanimator you're obviously not really playing time and then also shout out to my ever-growing grenadine family i have my special grenadine friend i have my battle chickens and now i have the adorable girl and the overprotective aunt so you know nicknames and grenadine families anyways do you have any honorable mentions or should we jump right into our top five well, remember that the name of this episode is the five cards from Revelations that will top eight yep. thrown open. So we're being pretty specific with what mm -hmm. the criterion are. That is absolutely why I put Blitzstone, Open Waste Supplier, and my Grenadine family as that. Because I love them, but I'm not necessarily they're going to top eight. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to count down the top five cards from Revelations that we think are going to top eight thrown open. And uh, I feel pretty confident about my list. So my number five is Freeze Out. That's the Hero Negate. Ooh. I just think that it's going to be a card that puts Kira back on the map because Kira was so bad against combo. There wasn't mm -hmm. a reliable way. At least, like, there weren't innovations that people had yet made in order to make it better against combo. It's a very fair deck doing very fair things. So I think that Freeze Out is going to help Kira and, like, a lot of the other pieces of the strategy are still there. It's just going to fit in that last market slot that we always could never find a good card for yeah absolutely there was always one market slot left and this fits the bill it shores up a massive weakness the deck has eight market access currently and that's a lot that means you can pretty reliably get access to it when you need to especially if you play etchings which means that you know you can play other things and hold up two power pretty reliably once you reach like turn five or six just ignore turn five right turn five kill if they're a mock combo they got the turn five kill but if you can just you know get past that one turn, right? You can just push through damage and, you know, hold up the two power and just win the game. For me, my turn five, uh, this is this is half of my show, so I'm going to be a cheaty, cheaty face, and I'm going to pick all of the power cards, all of the power options. We have blueprints, runes, and sketches. Uh, although, I guess to be a little fair, I will pick the, the three, the ones I think are perhaps the most likely. I think Rune of Trickery, out of all the runes, I think is the most likely to show up in Throne specifically. Because Rune of Trickery is the primal one. It's the one that gives you chill. I guess Rune of Flame, potentially like a modifier deck. But roughly speaking, Rune of Trickery, because if we have like a mock combo or realign the stars or just any sort of kind of controlling deck, they might like this sort of tempo game that they can get from playing their power for free. From the sketches, I think Fire Sketch in some ways has the highest chance of showing up. It's one of the cheaper ones. And it's pretty aggressive, right? You can just exhaust one of their units. You can just really put on the pressure and you know can really really make it hurt for them. And then for the blueprints, typically the shadow blueprints are obviously the ones that have the best chance of showing up because shadow has the most sacrifice of relic cards. Xenon is great because you have Waystone Gate. Argent Port is great because the rune itself is also pretty reasonable if you get to seven power. Uh, and, you know, obviously that's in the faction specifically of the discard stuff. And then Stone Scar is also pretty decent because it has extra ways to sack relics, such as recycle and it also maybe has that valkyrie although the valkyrie is more of an expedition card than a throne card uh so yeah all of the power cards <laughs> for my pick five okay so i picked one card and Stormblast already picked 15 but my number four no, oh, oh, oh come on oh come on i i kind of picked i kind of picked three i picked three <laughs> like three plus three so six. Oh come on <laughs> all right so my number four is spiny grenadine the grenadine that gives you Ooh. a Power burst on Entomb. I just think that this is going to be able to fit into Machinations combo or Tesseract combo in a way that is going to be something that the deck wants. Costing one on a Grenadine with an Entomb effect is definitely a good rate. So I think that this is going to show up in some sort of combo deck, and I think it's going to be what that deck wants. Uh, my number four is I'm picking Bottled Insight, a card that I sort of have been low on and, and to a extent, I'm actually still not necessarily high on it, but I think it'll show up in the top eight. Bottle Insight is the one primal draw card, Amplify 2 to draw and discard an additional card. And uh, that card, you know, we'll see play in a lot of different decks. Now, the reason that I might not see play, to play Devil's Act for myself, is that it doesn't play well with Grenahen specifically. Grenahen doesn't really like the card because you want to be playing units, and Grenahen obviously is now exceptionally powerful with all of these extra, you know, voided cards, right? Like Elding, Send a Message, obviously play really well with Grenahen, like really, really well with Grenahen, whereas Bottled Insight plays less well with Grenahen. Obviously, if even still is alive, obviously Bottled Insight doesn't play well there either. But Bottled Insight, nonetheless, if Mock Combo sees top eight potential, if there's a control deck that, you know, can get there, 
maybe classic reanimator potentially might play it. So I'm going to put Bottled Inside as my number four pick for card that will make the top eight. So my number three pick is a split pick, but there's a good <laughs> reason for it. It's Bottled Inside and Justice Sketch, because I think that those are the two biggest hits off of Dovid that the new set brings. Is Dovid going to be good? I'm not exactly sure, but I think Dovid is still a card with an absurd rate, and it just got two absolutely fantastic hits that you're really happy to play. Cards that don't take up any real slots. I Well, I don't know. It, like You could say that Bottled Inside takes up a real slot, but two cards that have effects that you want in a Dovid deck, and I think that they're going to show up alongside Janitor Dovid in some sort of deck. Yeah, Janitor Dovid is, is very good, and um, I almost forgot about Janitor Dovid. I wish I had forgotten about him, uh, but, but you know he's still out there, still lurking in the shadows, trying to clean up the Eternal community. Uh, my number three pick, I'm picking a, a somewhat of an interesting answer. This one also is going to make Sunny Cry. I'm picking Obstructive Flicker. I thought the card was good, but then I was like explaining it out loud to Sunny, and like Sunny was describing it to me, and I was like, wait, this card sounds really good. Like, this card sounds really, really good. And I kind of want to be playing this card, actually. If there's some sort of control deck out there, it's going to be playing Obstructive Flicker. And if it's good, it's going to be playing this card. And if it makes top eight, it'll be playing this card. And this card is surprisingly powerful. So I'm going to put this as my number three pick. Third most likely card to make a top eight. Okay, I suspect we might have some overlap in the top two. My number two <laughs> is a life for a life. I think that... Having the redundancy in the reanimator decks is going to make it just more consistent and it's already super powerful and a life for a life is going to help it along that path. It also got a lot of support in cards that like being discarded and ways of discarding cards. So I think a life for a life is going to show up in the top eight. Well, what a coincidence. I also put a life for a life in my number two slot. <laughs> I also think that it's really powerful and, you know, helps... Uh give consistency to reanimator decks and makes it cheaper. Reanimator decks oftentimes just have a lot of just random fodder lying out anyways. So it's not like it's the biggest deal to have to sacrifice something. Unless the opponent is super conscientious about removing every card that the reanimator deck plays, which is kind of difficult if they're playing cards like Dark Water Vines where you have to point, you know, real removal or uh, you know, two removal spells if they're playing damage based stuff. You know, you're gonna really kill a spore folk with annihilate. So there's always times there's lots of fire lingering, especially if now we're playing baseless ones. Yeah, life for life seems really good. It's cheaper than grasping at shadows. Yeah, I mean it adds consistency to the deck. Just a very powerful card. All right, judging by what's missing from your list, I think we have the same number one. Also, my number one is Elding of the Final Hour. Uh, oh boy, Fell Rock 2.0. Not as good as Fell Rock 1.0, <laughs> but it still seems like an absolute headache when paired with cards like Granahen and Swarfolk. And I'm like. Back alley delinquent. I think it's amazing with back alley delinquent because then you can be sure to discard it from your hand. Anyway, yeah, this card seems great, and I can see you adding it to <laughs> to the show notes on your side. Yeah, absolutely. Elding of the final hour was just far and away. I mean, in a sense, while I think Felrock is in a vacuum a better card, you might see more Eldings because it's easier to play. Felrock does cost primal, 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 shadow, shadow, shadow. Elding only costs Shadow Shadow, so you can play it in Argent Port. You can just, you know, play it more easily even in a Felm deck itself. If you're playing, you know, Chairman's Contracts to Mill Your Deck, obviously Elding's better there. You know, if you're playing Classic Reanimator with Privilege of Rank, Elding's better there. Yeah, it was funny when we when we were first talking about doing a top five, I'm like, Elding's really good. It's like my number one. So he's like, I don't know about that card, but you know, obviously he's he's you know, he's allowed to change his mind, especially as we were talking about this, but it is funny that he ended up putting it as number one. And we did have three of our five cards were the same, actually. Kind of. Three of my eight and three of Sunny's six are the same. <laughs> <laughs> of our top five. <laughs> Just to reiterate, my top five are Freeze Out at number five, Spiny Grenadine at number four, Bottled Inside and Justice Sketch at number three, basically Dovid cards, A Life for a Life at number two, and Elding of the Final Hour at number one. My number five is the power cards. Specifically, I'm choosing Rune of Trickery, Fire Sketch, and Argentport Blueprint. My number four is Bottled Insight. My number three is Obstructive Flicker. My number two is A Life for a Life. And my number one is Elding of the Final Hour. All right. I hope you enjoyed our evaluations of Revelations. It will be about a month until we see exactly what comes from 
uh, this set and what succeeds in, in the open. But I really look forward to seeing how right or wrong we were. Stormbust, why don't you go ahead and remind people the dates that are coming up that they should mark on their calendars. As always, as, we, as we've now been ending our cast, here are the important dates to remember for the future. Uh, today, it is the new set drop. When, you're, when you'll be listening to this, the new set will have dropped. Have fun. Play the set. Enjoy yourselves. Now, in three days on the day of our recording, on this Friday, May 21st, we have the Expedition TNE with the new set. So rather than jumping right into Throne, we are actually jumping into Expedition first for the TNE. And then on May 25th, we're having another Expedition TNE. And then finally, on June 5th, we're having the Spring Invitational, where we will have all the 12 people that won the TNE, or potentially 11, depending on if anyone double taps with the uh, wild card slots come show up have a good time watch some of the highest level eternal and uh cheer on sunny if you enjoy fe cast and you like sunny you know you can cheer him on because he will be there in this top 16 to be decided on june 5th and then finally uh what everyone else is hyped for is june 11th the thrown open the first major dire Wolf digital sponsored tournament with the new set 11 cards the thrown open on june 11th so look forward to that as always, FECast is made possible by our generous patrons at patreon.com. So a huge shout out to Odsos, Prewibin, Cotillion, Elseed Bava, Work Done Son, Chamomile, Chrissier, D-Dub, and Yeast Out for their continued support of FECast. And finally, a huge thank you to SRFS, who is going to be editing this two and a half hour monstrosity. And he's the one that really brings you FECast. Like, we may talk and stuff, but... The person that's really doing the legwork for this is our editor, SRFS. All right, that is all. We will see you next time when I'm sure we'll have more to talk about about how the metagame is developing and responding to the new set revelations and probably uh, we'll finally start talking about Expedition or, or Draft or something. I don't know. Anyway, thanks for listening. Good luck out there. And until next time, we will see you in the friend zone. The Friends of Eternal Discord is the best place on the internet to get better at Eternal. We have players of all skill and experience levels all happy to help each other out on basically any aspect of their Eternal gameplay. And making all this possible is our generous patrons over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to support FECast or Friends of Eternal, consider donating at Patreon.com slash Friends of Eternal. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, we'll see you in the Friends Zone.